The Lulberts, that's our word, brought to you by Fiat Money. Please donate wherever Fiat Money is mandated. The show is covered by a Creative Commons Zero license. No rights reserved, but all mites reserved. Uh, and I am here with none other than myself, uh, because uh, this is going to be a solo episode. At least the first half of it or so. Uh, the last hour and 15 minutes or so uh, is definitely going to have a co-host. But uh, we won't know exactly how long that is, uh, because I totally haven't done it yet. Uh, this is this is something that I re- definitely recorded first, uh, not after the last portion. Uh, I'm just just saying, just saying. So there's been a lot of kind of ideas floating for what would happen uh, for this 100th episode of the Lulberts. Uh One of the ideas that we had shopped around was uh, to pair off co-hosts to do a podcast together, and that uh, uh, we couldn't even get one one group of them to do it together uh, because everybody's time was so const- uh, constricted. Uh, and also, we've we've ended up kind of losing a couple of Lulberts along the way uh, for various reasons. Um, another idea was that we were going to have a radio drum, which still is in the works. We're still working on that. Unfortunately, it didn't move along as quickly uh, as we planned to get to the 100th episode, though a lot of strides have been made. Um, so we just decided to do what we normally do uh, on episodes that rhyme in 25. You see, every 25 episodes, uh, I tend to do a solo episode where I kind of go after some of the conspiracies that libertarians or misconceptions that libertarians have about certain things. So the first one was the 25th episode, uh, which was about the JFK assassination. The uh, 50th episode was about Monsanto. Uh, 75 wasn't a solo episode, but we did cover um, a lot of the uh, Freemason conspiracies. And we're kind of going along that same route again with the most contentious uh, conspiracy theory to, uh, to argue against in libertarian circles. Uh, which I think would be the most fitting for the one hundredth episode. No, it's not 9-11. It's the Federal Reserve Act. Um, so we are going to go after a lot of the Federal Reserve conspiracy theories um, and uh, still be very anti-Fed, which is kind of a weird mixture. Usually when you see people refute a lot of the conspiracy theories revolving around the Federal Reserve, you see people defending the Federal Reserve. And uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, though Larry might, because Larry... Uh, if I remember correctly, though I totally haven't recorded the last portion yet, uh, does have some sympathies with the th- with the Fed and thinks that it could be uh, uh, overhauled to to work a lot better. Uh, though I think he would much rather probably just get rid of the thing and, and institute some other form uh, some other forms of monetary policy. Um, either way, uh, <laughs> we're doing it. Uh, Whatever. I I don't know because I haven't asked him yet. I totally have not asked him yet. Uh, But either way. Um, So first of all, I bet you're wondering when the music's going to play. So uh, we actually did issue episode 100 out and I will link it. uh, I will put a link in the description to the uh, the, the file, which you can go and uh, and do, which I kind of have to. I'm going to have to figure out a way to do that because sometimes podcasters will throw that episode in uh, if you link <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, the file. So I'll figure out something somewhere to do it. I'll probably just, up, probably just link to a YouTube video version of it or something um, where mid sentence, it was interrupted by, um, by the album fingerprints by uh, fingerprints, fingerprints <laughs> by the residents. Uh, and then after that was Animal Lover. And um, a lot of people were like, God damn it. God damn it. How did you get me two years in a row? Well, it's because you people are fucking easy. <laughs> we're not going to do that again. Uh, we're definitely not doing it again. And that's not a setup for next year's. Uh, I already have ideas in the can for April Fool's uh, next year. Um, so we'll see how that goes. And I, I think uh, it'll be much more entertaining than it was last time. I know one person complained like you did that joke last year. But he still fell for it. So, fuck you. <laughs> you still fell for it, and you'll still keep falling for it. But uh, we won't know because I'm not going to do that again. And that, that's the honest God truth. I have some uh, much better ideas for April Fool's jokes going forward. Um, so let me start off by before we get into the, the meat of this. Uh, and there's lots of meat. Before we get into the meat of this, I need to make this absolutely clear, because once you start going after Federal Reserve conspiracies, the tendency is to automatically assume that you're pro-Fed, right? 
And so if you see anybody in the comment section of the video version of this uh, claiming that I'm pro-Fed uh, or anything like that, uh, kindly respond uh, telling them that they're a moron. And I, I'm encouraging you to do this. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, also, speaking of YouTube videos, um, the Lulbers is definitely moving off of my channel. I, I don't know if a lot of you have noticed uh, my YouTube channel uh, as of late. Uh, all of the Lulbers episodes are slowly starting to slip away. I haven't gotten all of them yet, but I'm getting there. Uh, I haven't gotten all of them yet. And they're going over to the uh, the new Lul the old new Lulberts channel, uh, which I will also provide a link in the description uh, of the of the podcast, so you can go and subscribe there if you prefer the YouTube version of this. This episode is going to stay uh, go on my main channel because uh, this is an important episode. It's one of those episodes that I'm going to keep up because I'm not getting rid of all of them. The ones that I am getting rid of are you know the normal libertarian back and forth stuff that I have with uh, with my co-hosts. Um, but the, the episodes that are, that we specifically go after a target or that I do do solo, which is going after a particular, uh, topic or something like that. Those are all, um, staying on my channel. Whereas the other ones are, are not. And a lot of it has to do with kind of the YouTube algorithm. And, uh, it's, it's really hurting my channel to have these long form podcasts up on my channel, uh, because it's hurting the views of my, my other videos. You know, I went from having videos that were 500 plus views on them at minimum uh, to, you know, finding it really hard to break out of the 200 ish um, square. Uh, and a lot of videos I've seen uh, have been in the uh, under uh, less than three digits. Um, and it has to do a lot with uh, the Lulberts episodes. It started happening with uh, the uploading of the Lulberts episodes. So all of those are being moved over. The The exceptions, I think, I have, the, I have a Molyneux video, uh, the two Kokesh episodes, um, uh, and, and this one. This will, be the, this will be the last one that goes up on my thing because I, th I think a lot of people are going to be really interested uh, in uh, what I'm going to have to say about the banks, or about the Federal Reserve Bank system. Um, so yeah, so let's just get right into it, okay? Uh, so again, I'm going to reiterate just to make sure that everybody understands because there, I know there's people in the nosebleeds as soon as you start hearing this stuff. Um, just because I'm anti-Fed conspiracy does not mean that I am pro-Fed. Uh, you can be anti-Fed and anti-Fed conspiracy theories. Uh, the reason why I wanted to, to, to do this uh, was because uh, a lot of times I will talk to people who um, are interested in, in the ideas of libertarianism and the instance you start criticizing the federal reserve on the basis that, um, they, they cause, uh, really bad economic problems for the United States. Um, the immediate assumption from then on is, Oh, you're one of those anti fed conspiracy nut jobs. Uh, I bet you hate the Jews too. I bet you think the Illuminati is after you. Um, because a lot of the people who, who, who support these these Federal Reserve kind of conspiracy theories do tend to lean towards that. Uh, but we're going to save all that stuff for the latter portion of it. I think in order for us to understand why a lot of these uh, conspiracy theories are incorrect is to first have a really strong foundational understanding about the Federal Reserve System, how it was created, the history of banking in the United States, for the most part, not all of the, we're not going to go into the very first period, but you'll see. Um, to get an understanding of, of, of what, the, what, the, what it was like to be on the ground in the United States of America uh, during various banking eras of the United States before you can have a – and, and then what the sentiment was on the ground with, with what it was politically for you to have an understanding of why a lot of the things that are said in books like The Creature from Jekyll Island or films like Freedom to Fascism or The Death of the American Dream, why these – don't hold any water whatsoever. And when people see them who do have a little bit of, of knowledge or expertise or understanding of history re, uh, regarding the uh, late 1800s of the United States and the uh, the early uh, early uh, 20th century of the United States, they look at that and go, wow, you're fucking crazy. You don't know what you're talking about because you probably don't. Um, now, I used to be a big believer in this stuff. I even kind of took it a step further. I was actually an anti- 
uh, a tax protester as well. Although I never did it, I was too afraid. <laughs> I never actually, I, I, I did pay my taxes, but I was generally under uh, the belief that, you know, that there was no law saying you had to pay the federal income tax. And most of the people who were telling me this uh, through various media and stuff like that, they're all uh, sitting in a jail cell somewhere, uh, if not dead. Um, so, you know, I've kind of re- revised my view on that. Maybe I'll do an episode on tax uh, protesters one of these days, but that's a huge subject to tackle, uh, even more so than the Federal Reserve. And this, there's a lot on my plate uh, for this episode, a lot on my plate. Uh, and that's before we even get into the conspiracy theories around it, uh, which I have not recorded yet. I totally did not record it yet. All right. So, um, again, to understand what, what's wrong with these Federal Reserve conspiracy theories, we have to understand what it was like in the United States in terms of banking. So there was an era uh, in the United States. Um, well, before we get into that, let's, let's just make this very clear. Uh, there has never been a free market banking system in the United States. It never existed. Uh, not, uh, you know, pre-colonial, uh, not post-colonial. There, there was there was just nothing right uh, after after the uh, after the United States became the United States of America, um, it, we had constitutions and all that stuff, and the founding fathers, you know, blessed us from on high from on their thrones. Um, <laughs> there there was no uh, free market banking in the United States. Uh, there ha- never has been. Um, so that's a really important point to, uh, to bring up. Uh, and in fact, all of the banking systems uh, throughout the, the history of the United States, some were better than most. And uh, some could argue that some of these systems were even worse uh, than the Federal Reserve System that we have today, believe it or not. Uh, we're going to tackle the, the last two eras b- right before uh, the creation of the Fed, because I think that those ones are the most important, because those are the ones that people have in mind when they think of the problems with, quote unquote, free banking, right? And what better way to start into that is to talk about the free banking era. So the free banking era, and I'm, you can't see this, but I'm putting up quotation marks, scare quotes around the free banking. Uh, the free banking era will range from, uh, span from 1837 to 1862. And during that time, very, uh, the, there was no real state regulations when it came, or government federal government regulations when it came to banking. All of this stuff was really came down to on the state level. Um, and these state state level laws, uh, regulations rather, regarding uh, how these banks were formed really came down from state to state and they varied wildly. Uh, and they had very stringent and strict rules. Uh, first, uh, banks had to be chartered by the state, which means that in order for you to set up a bank in, in a particular uh, a particular state, right, in order for you to do that, you would have to be in some way politically connected to that government, uh, to the state government, in order for you to set up a, a bank, right? You had to be politically connected in some way. They didn't just hand them out. Um, now, those banks also issued their own currency, their own, their own bank notes, right? Um, but they had to back them up with some sort of species. And the amount of species, the, the reserve requirements really depended on the state. Um, they could, you know, they could range from, all, you know, whatever percent to whatever percent. Um, but for the most part, they were very stringent about how much, uh, how much they had, to ha- how much species they had to have. Uh, now, the state mandated certain amounts of uh, reserves. Uh, and they also sent interest rates, not just for loans, but for deposits as well. So if you went into a bank and you wanted to get a loan and they said, okay, we'll give you a, you know, a fixed, a fixed loan at, at, you know, 10 point, whatever percent, um, whatever. I don't, I don't really know too much about <laughs> what the, what the proper amount is for a loan. I'm pretty sure that's really high. Uh, but maybe at 3%, right? We'll say like you, you, you wanted to get a loan. They wanted to charge you 3%. Um, that 3% wasn't dictated by uh, any sort of like f- market price for, for interest rates, right? They weren't calculating it based on how you would expect kind of like markets to determine this thing. Like, well, there seems to be a lot of depositors lately. And because there's a lot of depositors lately, uh, we, we have extra money on reserves that we can lend out. So we're going to lower the interest rate to encourage uh, borrowing. Uh, or if you know there wasn't enough reserves on deck, you know they can increase the the, the rates. Um, 
and or increase the rates of it, of interest to kind of discourage that and and only give it to people who are in, who are uh, who 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 really felt the need that they that they would pay that interest rate for it, right? Um, and when we get into the Austrian business cycle, you can kind of see why. Because we'll get into that later, but you can kind of see why this is uh, why this could be a big problem, right? Uh, if if a bank does have a, a certain requirement for loan uh, interest rates. Uh, that those loans could be, uh, you know, the loans could be taken out of the wrong periods of time, where you know banks may not have that much on reserves, uh, and vice versa. So yeah, um, now banks could have, according to the state rules, banks could only had a limit about how many branches they were allowed to own in that state, right? Uh, and it depended widely on the state. Some of them had quite a bit. So you could have like 20. I don't know the exact number, the high end of this is, but let's just say it's 20 for the sake of uh, for whatever. So you have like 20, right? Some states would say, no, you can only have five. Some would say you can only have one. And some said you can only have zero because they don't allow banking whatsoever. And there was a lot of states that forbid banking within uh, within their state. But all states... All states in the union uh, had requirements that said uh, you are not allowed to open up a bank across state lines. So let's say that I had a, a couple of banks, that like I'm a banker, and I had many different banks um, in my state. And I'm saying, you know what? Uh, I have so many banks here in Nevada. Uh, it would be great if I opened up a, a bank over, you know, right across right across the river in King uh, in Kingman, Arizona. Um, that would not be allowed. Uh, I would be forbidden under any state r rules, uh, I'd be prohibited to, uh, prohib ah, prohibited to do that. And uh, the states would mandate that these banks buy various forts, uh, uh, various types of bonds, and, and not just state bonds, but like railroad bonds and that sort of thing as well. So the states really like the, some of these banks. A lot of the states like these banks, not all of them. But a lot of these things like uh, states love this kind of banking system uh, because they had a captive market for uh, for, 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 uh, for bonds. Um, uh, now there were some problems with it for the most part, it ran pretty well ish. It wasn't the best system, obviously. Uh, but for the most part, it ran pretty well and it ran pretty well, much better than it did in, in later incarnations that we would see later on down the line. But the banks would only really exist about five years or so. According, according to, to, to some historians, they would last about five years on average, uh, and that, which would, would mean that once the bank goes out, you know, the, the currency would be basically worthless. You know, you'd be basically holding money uh, that's that you couldn't turn in for specie. Uh, but, you know, uh, for the most part, there was like kind of like clearinghouses, almost like a like a like a market central bank where you would have um, banks in a certain area. Uh, like out in the middle, middle of the wilderness or something, uh, and they would they would have issues with something like they would they would run out of money uh, to pay back uh, depositors, and they would um, go towards a, a larger bank and then ask them, and they would be and they would basically offer them a loan uh, and be a lender to that bank so that they could pay off uh, debtors until they can get uh, you know cleared up or whatever, um, which was which was okay. It worked for the most part, but there was some issues. Now. There was a thing called the um, the wildcat banking. Uh, this is kind of one of the myths that come up with with the with the uh, free banking era system, right? Is that there would be banks that would set up out in the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of the woods, while the wildcats are, mm -hmm. um, and what they would do is they would set up shop. They would they would ignore all these regulations that that the state would in, would impose, and then issue about a bunch of money out. And then when people came to collect on that, they would they would find out that these banks no longer existed. They would close up shop and leave town. They would have gotten their, their golden leave. Uh, and that's one of the things that kind of come up when a lot of people talk about the free banking era uh, back in those days is they would talk about wildcat banks. Uh, though they did happen, for the most part, you, this is kind of mostly a myth. Um, a lot of historians in the early 80s and uh, or early 80s in the 80s and 90s somewhere in there kind of did some empirical data studies and found out that the wildcat banking phenomenon was extremely rare. Uh, and when they did happen, they were they took places in a lot of those states that had very stringent rules against banking. Right. So the more liberal kind of states, uh, state rules about uh, the states that had the more liberal rules about banking tended not to have the, this sort of problem. Um 
but it, it, they did exist, and it's, it's worth pointing out that this was a thing. Um, but it really is kind of overstated by people who are opposed to um, any kind of liberalization of, of, of the banking system. And again, it's not the best banking system. It was very heavily regu- regulated, uh, and it definitely does not fall under what we would call today to be free banking, unless you're talking about it in the historical sense. Now, the, after that, uh, we had the national banking system, and that, that ran during uh, 1863 to, uh, to 1913, right, obviously. Uh, but there was a big thing that was happened right about that era when it st- first started happening. It was a little thing uh, where uh, President Kennedy um, set up a blockade around Vietnam. Perhaps you might have heard of it. It was called World War I. Um, no, okay. That's... <laughs> Uh, red letter media reference. I'm sorry. Um, no, there was a, a little war in the United States called the Civil War, uh, which uh, I don't know if you heard about, but it was a thing. And during this thing, uh, there was a president by the name of Abraham Lincoln. Now, Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War, uh, needed loans in order to pay back uh, for the war that he was uh, fighting uh, in the South against the Southern Confederacy. Um, this was also the era of like the greenbacks. This is where we got the term greenbacks. Uh, the, this was money that the federal uh, the federal government printed uh, in order to uh, help pay for the war uh, in, uh, against the South. And the reason why they called them greenbacks is because at the time they would print money with black ink, uh, but uh, if they printed money with green ink. Then they could, uh, you know, then they could could know which which bills were, uh, were 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 printed inflationary in order to do that. And the fact that we're talking about Abraham Lincoln setting up a new banking system and issuing of inflationary currency will become important later once we talk about uh, <laughs> once we talk about uh, uh, some of the conspiracies uh, going forward. Yes, he is involved in the Federal Reserve conspiracy if you can fucking believe it. Uh, so anyways, uh, the government set up uh, national bank charters, right? Uh, so they, they passed this bill. I think it was called the National Banking Act because I have my notes ready, right? <laughs> they said they had this bill. Uh, and what they basically did is they offered all of these these free banking states, uh, uh, ba- free banking things, right? And they said, look, we have this, this great proposal for you. Um, we're going to let you have a bank. Uh, and it'll be part of a national bank system, and uh, you can uh, you can issue currencies in your state, uh, just like you're doing now. Uh, but all you have to do is follow your current state re- regulations and everything, and you have to buy our bonds. Um, uh, and if you do this, you know there'll be off there'll be basically kind of like more clearing houses options to you. And on top of that, um, you you know you won't have to pay a ten percent tax for being a state bank, and uh, you know it's kind of a great thing when 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 the government comes to you and says, "Hey, uh, we have more rules that you need to follow." Oh, yeah, that was also another thing. There was more stringent rules uh, regarding uh, what they could do in their banks, um, and so they said, "Hey, I mean, it's a deal you can't refuse. Like, hey, follow all these." Uh, these new rules and regulations that we have, or you pay a 10% tax. And of course, uh, people didn't want to pay the 10% tax, so they started complying. Uh, not all of them, uh, but the overwhelming majority of, of these banks tended to move over to the national banking system to avoid the 10% tax. So I, I, I believe, uh, I've, I've heard conflicting kind of accounts on this, uh, but state banks started to rebound a little bit a little uh, after checking accounts happened. Uh, and then I think the national banks took over again, but whatever. Um, now there was issues with this, obviously, um, because you know it's the government; <laughs> they, they tend not to think things through all the way. Uh, what ended up happening a lot of times was that these clearing houses would be set up like this, right? So you would have a bank out in the middle of nowhere, right? Let's say you have a bank, let's just say Pahrumpa, Nevada, which is out in the middle of fucking nowhere, uh, but there's whorehouses. But there's, for the most part, it's out in the middle of fucking nowhere. And let's say that there is a uh, a run in the bank or a panic uh, in, at one of the uh, the local branches out there. Well, the main branch in Las Vegas would go, oh, how about this? We'll lend you some money until you get your house in order. Uh, but what ended up happening a lot of the times because of all these rules is that that happened way too often. And uh, what would end up happening is the major banks in, in, uh, in uh, Las Vegas would end up having to call the main bank out in, uh, in in New York to ask for more species once things got got really ugly. 
Um, and also the federal government also offered certain things like um, certain kinds of uh, some, some sorts of bailouts, but these bailouts would take about six weeks in order to process. And if you can imagine what would happen in six weeks when you have a whole line outside of your bank saying, hey, give us our money and you don't have money, uh, there's not really not much you can do besides just close up shop and say, fuck it. Uh, and that's what a lot of banks did. So there was a lot of panics that happened. Um, there was many panics, um, most of which. Uh, most of which, uh, or the, the biggest one, the most important one would be the one that happened in 1907. Um, and also when these bank runs happened and then New York couldn't pay the bill, uh, they would definitely send out a ripple effect through the rest of the uh, rest of the country uh, and cause even more panics. And that's when we get into the Knickerbocker crisis of 1907, or AKA the panic of 1907, uh, where some some market investors decided that they were going to try to 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 to, to corner the market on, on on I think it was the United Copper or whatever, and uh, it backfired. And uh, what ended up happening was the stock, this whole entire New York Stock Exchange, um, uh, took a deep shit <laughs> and uh, plummeted to fifty percent. Um, there were runs on banks. Uh, businesses were going bankrupt. People were getting disgusted at banks. And this also spurred a lot of support for what the, the, uh, the coming progressive era. Now, at the time, now you have to remember, out of all the things I just told you, right, is that you had this system where people had the perception of, well, we just tried free market banking. We had a free banking era, and there was problems with that. Then we tried to fix it with some regulations, and that didn't work, right? That there needs to be some sort of federal agency that would have reserves so that they could be a lender of last resort when there was a run on the bank or there was a panic. You can kind of see why they call it the Federal Reserve and why they refer to it as the lender of last resort. It's because people wanted a federal central bank that had reserves to bail out the small banks and be a lender of last resort when there was a panic. Um, you have to remember, right, that this is the era of, of Woodrow Wilson, where, you know, like where people, these are the same people who elected Woodrow Wilson into power. And Will, Woodrow Wilson ran on a campaign to say, hey, I want to uh, institute a central bank because all of these bank panics just keep happening and it's awful and we can't trust the free market to do it itself. There has to be a government institution to prevent this from happening again. And one of his campaign, uh, one of the pillars of his campaign was to introduce a uh, central bank amongst with a bunch of other progressive kind of things. Um, now, there was a couple of reforms that were on the table at the time, including um, uh, getting rid of bond requirements and branching restrictions that would have solved most of the problems. Uh, but even though those, those were on the table, uh, they were politically infeasible for a couple of reasons. Uh, most people, because of the growing progressive sentiment at the time, didn't want it. Uh, and a lot of small town banks didn't want it. Um, and they were very well politically connected to their 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 state senate. Um, so you can kind of see that this was kind of a problem, right? Okay. So, J.P. Morgan uh, during this crisis was encouraging other bankers at the time to start putting up their own money uh, to help pay back depositors during the uh, during the uh, panic of 07. Um and also encouraging them to help draft legislation that could basically create a new central bank. I know it's kind of like finding out that like, you know, like your neighbor kid mowed everybody's lawn for free. And then later that night put burning bags of poop on everyone's lawn. But anyways, um, so in uh, November of 1910, there was a small group of representatives from major banks, some economists, local bankers, some representatives of the federal government and a senator all came together to Jekyll Island, uh, to the Jekyll Island Club. Uh, they were planning to help draft legislation that would later become the uh, become the Federal Reserve Act. Uh, though the proposal wasn't used, uh, it was very instrumental in uh, providing some key aspect for this legislation. Um, though the one that they that they were proposing would be much more centralized than the uh, the Federal Reserve that exists today, uh, which is a good thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but. 
Because this meeting was done in secret, uh, a lot of conspiracy theorists kind of glob onto this thing and try to attack it on every way. Uh, but it was secret for good reason. Uh, like most meetings regarding legislation uh, of economic matters, uh, it was quiet, but the details were made public later, just like you know most other ones, right? Uh, but it's not uncommon for these politicians to ask people uh, who they see as experts in their industry to help them draft legislation uh, for those industries. And they usually do so in private. And there's all kinds of reasons why uh, that's the case. Uh, you don't want people to... Um, People, people who are speculative markets, like in the speculative markets, know what's going to happen in the future so that they can, you know, kind of do some sort of insider trading. Um, they don't want that. So they kind of keep everything under covers. And then once uh, legislation gets drafted and passed it, then they'll be like, oh, yeah, so here's what this meeting was. In fact, Paul Warburg, who was attended the meeting, actually wrote a book about the meeting, which you can go and read. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff in there that kind of refute a lot of the stuff that's uh, kind of being spread uh, around about the Federal Reserve thing. Um, which we will get into uh, later, which I totally haven't recorded yet. Um, but again, it wouldn't be for another three years that a bill would reach the House. Uh, and a bill reached the House in August of 1913, and it passed Congress uh, in December of that year uh, with 298 to... Uh, it, it passed 298 to 60, uh, and it passed in the House with uh, 54 to 34. Was it? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, 34. And there was some minor fuckery in the Senate, but whatever. Um, and, and that's really interesting, right? Is that there was some sort of fuckery that was happening in the Senate, which I'm not going to get into because it's kind of irrelevant. But a lot of a lot of conspiracy theorists like to glob onto the fact that Congress was uh, not really present during the debate because uh, this legislation was passed uh, on Christmas Eve, Eve, the 23rd of December of that year, when most congressmen and senators were at home drinking. Uh, and so they go like, wow, they must have not voted on it or, vo or debated on it or whatever. Um, and we'll get into the mostly the reasons why, but to briefly kind of touch on that, uh, basically travel was really expensive back in those days. Air travel really wasn't uh, too much of a thing. It was very expensive in order to do. And so a lot of... Um, congressmen and senators kind of reworked them remotely. Uh, and they were reading this uh, for, for many months before or from August uh, from that year to, to late December um, deciding what, what to do about this thing. So this was not any kind of secret. And uh, because it passed 298 to 60 in the Congress, it sort of should be like a big red flag to let you know that sure they may have been home, but they still voted what's going on there. But, that, that's that's about it for the conspiracy portion until we get to the very end, right? Um, so yeah, even though they weren't present during the vote, they still voted. They were still aware of the bill. Uh, and many Democrats, in fact, all Democrats, uh, wanted this legislation to pass. It's really the, the Republicans that were kind of uh, opposed opposed to the, the, legis the, the types of legislation that the Democrats are putting forward, although a lot of them did want some sort of centralized system. Now, I want to quote from you from the American Institute of Economic Research, which uh, I don't advocate anything that they that they stand for. I'm sure uh, I haven't dug too deeply into them, but we can kind of get an idea of their explanation of what's going on with this thing. And I think this one's important. So in its final form, the Federal Reserve Act represented a compromise among three political groups. Most Republicans and Wall Street bankers favored the Aldrich plan that came out of Jekyll Island. Progressive Democrats demanded a, a reserve system and currency supply owned by and controlled by the government in order to carry counter the money trust and destroy the existing centralization of credit resources in Wall Street. The conservative Democrats proposed a decentralized reserve system owned and controlled privately, but free of Wall Street domination. No group got exactly what they wanted, but the Aldrich plan uh, more nearly represented the compromise position between the two Democratic streams, and it was closest to the final legislation passed. So, what the Federal Reserve is, it's sort of a decentralized central bank, right? And just because I'm using the term decentralized doesn't mean that it means good. I mean, it could mean better. We, we don't know. We don't have a time machine to go back and, and put in a more centralized system. Uh, but uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe, question mark. Um, they've since given themselves more powers uh, later on. Um, which I'm not sure if I'm going to be touching on just yet because we're going to get into some some kind of the reasons why the, the Federal Reserve System uh, sucks in just a bit. Um, but it's important to note that 
this is this is not a private bank. This is what they would call an independent federal government agency. This is this is from their own mouth. This is from the government's own mouth telling you that this is though it's independent, it's still a federal government agency. Uh, so, a board of directors are seven members appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Uh, they operate twelve regional banks with twenty-five members. In order for a member bank, that means the private banks that you go to, uh, can be a member bank of it, they have to buy stock in, in their. Uh, they have to buy stocks in their local Federal Reserve banks, uh, and they also vote to elect six of the nine board members. The Federal Reserve dictates interest rates, decides and, and enacts monetary policy, and is a lender of last resort. Uh, the governors testify uh, under oath to Congress uh, uh, regularly, and they are accountable to Congress. Now, I'm not going to delve too deeply into the uh, the Federal Reserve's track record, uh, because that's boring and it would bore you to tears. Uh, but we're going to kind of, I'm going to kind of explain to you what the Austrian business cycle theory is, because it's really vital to understand why the Federal Reserve sucks and why it needs to be abolished. And I'm not going to do it in a very dry way. I, I hope I've been keeping this fairly entertaining. I'm, I'm trying to avoid uh, overly complex technical babble. Uh, and this is going to be kind of difficult for me <laughs> to, to get through this particular aspect of it. Uh, but I'm going to use kind of a lot of analogies to kind of help you understand uh, what the Federal Reserve does, why it sucks, uh, and everything else. And it's because of the Austrian business cycle theory. Now, I know a lot of you are going like, oh, here we go. We're going to learn about Austrian economics from a libertarian again. And hold on. Now, I know I do have a lot of... Um, I know I have I know I have some communists that listen to to this podcast because a lot of time they're more interested uh, in hearing about the latest libertarian drama and this is definitely the show for you if you're interested in that and I know a lot of communists who have reached out to me over the years of listening to this podcast and said like yeah I was listening to you because I wanted to hear you know you talk shit on other libertarians and give me some fodder to kind of argue against some of these uh, people and then the more I listened to you the more I kind of got an idea of you know um, th that maybe this particular viewpoint that I have is maybe not correct. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know if anyone has become like a full ANCAP yet. Uh, but I do know some people who have abandoned Marxism because uh, of that kind of process. But again, I try to keep the show kind of lighthearted and fun and interesting and not too deep into technical jargon or anything like that, because I think it's important. I think it's important to, uh, to help kind of convey the ideas that I'm, that I'm interested in in a fun and entertaining way. So that's basically what I'm doing. But, I, you know, I want to have it so it's kind of easier for you to understand. And I'm not an Austrian. Uh, and I've, I've, I've I, if you want to go back and listen to my contrarian episode, I think it was episode 77. Uh, it was a solo episode uh, that I did because there was a lot of upset people that I didn't have a solo episode uh, in, in one of my previous podcasts. Uh, where I talk about, you know, wh where my stance is on certain things like the non-aggression principle. And one of the things I talked about was that I don't necessarily subscribe to the Austrian Business School. And if you want a full explanation of that, that's a really good podcast to check out if you're really interested in what my perspectives are. Uh, but I do think that there is a lot of empirical data that shows that the Austrian business cycle theory uh, does hold a lot of water. Uh, and it's kind of hard to refute, especially since this last economic recession, uh, once you really kind of dive into the meat of the situation, after you have an understanding of the Austrian business cycle theory, it seems to make a whole lot of sense. Uh, Tom Woods wrote a book, I believe it's called Meltdown. Uh, if you're really interested in the really precise reasons why um, the Austrian business cycle theory does apply to the recession of 2007. Um, and I highly recommend you read that if you want a further explanation. But this is just kind of going to be a quick, brief overview of the Austrian business cycle theory. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm building this up, not because I'm, I'm uh, for, for any other reason, just to say that, like, calm down, it's going to be really short, it's going to be really brief, and it's not going to be boring, right? Okay. So if you understand how markets work, right, is that it's basically kind of like a very interconnected system, right? Um, which is kind of interesting because like a lot of libertarians get accused of being kind of uh, or having this position that they're their own island. Uh, and that that's not the case. It's just that libertarians understand that everything is interconnected. And the best way to have everything interconnected is allow people to basically kind of go out and do what they want uh, and provide uh, how they see fit to society. And if they do well, they will be rewarded uh, in the form of a profit, right? Uh, and that's no different for a bank. If a bank is offering uh, loans 
and and they're taking in money uh, to, for you know for depositors who want to have bank accounts and earn a little bit of interest, they have to act competitively. And in order for a bank right to to make money, they have to make loans. They just can't take everybody's money in and then give them interest. That wouldn't make any sense. And you wouldn't make any money if you just said we're just going to hold your money. We're just going to take your money and hold on to it, make sure it's safe, right? Because it's like, well, well then what's the point? Really, what's the point? And uh, what's the point of, of, of it for the bankers if they're not going to make any any profit off the off the top of it? So what they do is they take your money and they and they put it in a big mattress in the back, right? And what they do is they end up loaning out uh, this this money uh, to the to people who want to make long term investments, right? So I'm a business owner, right? And I want to um, start a business, but my business uh, probably won't get off the ground for a couple of years. You know, I need to do some some market research and all that stuff. I got to do some R and D, uh, but I do need a loan in order to do a lot of this stuff. Uh, so I submit a, a proposal to my bank and say, "Hey, uh, I'm going to start a business and I'm going to make these widgets, right?" Um, and the bank goes, "Hey, you know what? That's a really cool business plan. Uh, here's a loan, uh, but..." If we're going to loan you money, there's got to be in it for something for us. So we're going to charge you interest. And I think that this is going to be a good amount of interest in order for you to do that. Now, how they calculate that interest uh, isn't just something that they just swim up and say, like, oh, we want to make a bunch of money, right? They have to be competitive and there has to be a good reason why they're charging the, the interest rate they have. Now, see, if a bunch of people are depositing money into their bank, right, um, then they have the opportunity to, uh, to, to loan out more money. Right. And if you have a lot of money to loan out, that means that you're not making money. <laughs> right. You're not making money on, on the money that you're uh, supposed that you are supposed to be uh, adding interest on uh, to these to these um, to these uh, people who are who are letting you hold their money. Right. Because that's the whole point of having a bank is to earn a little bit of interest on there or for checking accounts or whatever. Um, so if there's a lot of money in the bank system. Right. Uh, they need to get rid of that money as quickly as possible. So they're going to be uh, a little bit more lenient on giving people loans. So they lower the interest rate. Now, when a lot of people are saving, that's a really good time for people to, for, for businesses or entrepreneurs not to be producing things, but instead to invest in long-term investment for research and development, for, uh, for more capital goods, like more machines to build the things that people want, right? Okay, uh, so that's the good time to do that. When people aren't saving, people are spending, that's when businesses want to stop long-term investment and start producing things for people to buy, right? And if they're not saving, they're not putting money in their bank account. If they're not putting money in their bank account, banks don't have enough money to lend out, which means the interest rates goes up, which means that that, let's say that I'm a business owner and I want to engage in some long-term investment, right? And I go to the bank and they're like, yeah, we want 13% though. You're going to be like, ooh, that's steep. I'm going to wait, right? Uh, unless it's some someone who really is like, I don't care if it's 13%. I have this brilliant, brilliant idea. Um, and I'm going to, and I'm going to take that money anyway. Right. Um, so it's not to say that it's going to completely stop it or completely let it go. It's not a complete on and off switch, you know, but it is, it is kind of like a sink, you know, you can have a drizzle or you can have it flowing. Right. So there is definitely an equilibrium that happens in the market, you know, things, uh, you know, spending goes up uh, in particular areas. And then sometimes people are a little bit more spendthrift and they don't want to spend a whole lot of money. And when that happens, that's when entrepreneurs make decisions. That also is a reflection since money is connected to resources that are existing in the economy. It is a reflection of the resources that are out there. So it kind of has like a natural ebb and flow, right? And this is how it's kind of been for quite some time. However, if there is someone on the outside saying, yeah, that's great that your interest rates are 13%. I think that's a little high. We want to spur more economic growth. Like not a lot of people are spending and we think spending is always good or mostly good or we think that people should spend more often than most people are doing anyway. How about you lower your interest rates? But don't worry. If something bad happens to you, we're the lender of last resort. We'll bail you out, right? And if things get really fucking hairy, we'll really bail you out and, uh, you know, basically pay off your debts and whatever, like like what happened in uh, 2008, you're too big to fail and everything. So what they do is they lower that interest rates. Well, that tells entrepreneurs, hey, now's a good time for long-term speculative investment rather than producing for consumers who are buying now, right? So 
you can kind of see how that kind of throws the equilibrium off a lot, right? So if you can imagine in the water, like let's say that you're in the ocean, right? And the, the ocean has a, a gentle ripple that's constantly going, right? That's kind of fun. It's interesting. But what if instead of having that constant ripple, you know, like someone's go, like in there, like, <laughs> well, maybe not the ocean, right? But, but a pool, probably a better example. But someone's in the pool and they're, they're splashing around in their, in their inflatable tube and then water's splashing out everywhere. That's basically kind of what's, what's happening. Um, but since those things are connected to real world resources, right? What you're basically telling entrepreneurs is they're in, in an analogy sense is you're a, const- a building contractor, right? You're going to build uh, a development of houses and you have a bunch of resources sitting right there. And you look at all those resources and you go, that's enough for 30, right? You haven't gone in and checked, but all of the signals definitely are there to show you that you have enough resources. You have enough bricks, wood, workers, uh, you know, nails, all that stuff enough to build 30 houses. Right. And so you go, let's build 30 houses. So you develop your plan to build 30 houses. You start building all of your 30 houses at once. By the time we are halfway done, you start to realize, Oh no, no, no. We only had enough for 20. So you start going, okay, well, hold on. Stop everything right now. Uh, crush those 10 houses over there, reclaim whatever you can. You're not going to get all of it. Reclaim what you can and try to build, you know, what you can from those. And what is happening is because you misallocated all those resources into all those extra houses, you're not going to get, get all of that back. What you're probably going to get back is a small portion of it. So for this analogy, you try to build 30 houses, but you only had stuff for 20. But now because you wasted t- enough for 10, you can only now build 10 houses because you wasted all the resources to do that. And then that's when the crash happens, right? In in the metaphorical sense. So you have all these industries being artificially propped up and encouraged through, uh, through, through low interest rate, artificially low interest rates in order to spur investment where investment, where there is no demand for it. What ends up happening is the tides change and, and, the, and now all those people who were, who were doing one way before then their, 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 their changes stop. And then, you know, then you start to realize like, Oh no, there really wasn't all of this, uh, this money in the first place. It was all a lie. And then things go, go abrupt. Right. That's basically kind of like a brief analysis of the Austrian business cycle theory. Um, and that's basically what you saw with the real estate housing crisis in, in 2007, very, very briefly, uh, what they did is starting with Bill Clinton and then George W. Bush, uh, we're really pushing for uh, everybody to have their own home. It was, it was the American dream to own your own home. So they started telling all of these, uh, these banks to lower their, re- uh, their lending requirement. Don't worry if anything happens, we'll, we'll bail you out. We're going to lower interest rates, encourage people to go out and buy a home for the first time. Home, st- uh, home prices started skyrocketing. Uh, more people started lending, lending out these things. And then they started doing like adjustable rate mortgages. And then once they realized that, oh, no, 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 that, that demand was artificially created. And people say like, yeah, we, we don't need houses anymore. The whole bottom of this thing falls out. There really wasn't that demand for housing in the first place. People didn't want to buy a new home. People were completely content on, on, on uh, renting this whole time. Uh, and then everybody lost out, including the people who were suckered into these to these uh, to these adjustable rate mortgages, and everybody and everything went, went tits up. You know, Lehman Brothers got fucked, Goldman Sachs got fucked, uh, Washington Mutual got really fucked. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, like I said, there's a really good book about it, Meltdown by Tom Woods. Highly recommend that you go check this out. But see, as you can see, like I just described, a really good reason why the Federal Reserve is not a good institution. Right, and it, it didn't require me to delve into these secret Illuminati Jews uh, <laughs> that that are really secretly controlling all of the money to explain why that is the case. Right, I hope that's that's uh, that's going to be uh, very important later on. Now, before we delve into the conspiracy stuff of it, and, and I, I I I have a feeling that I, that I because it's I haven't I totally haven't recorded it yet, but I have a feeling I have a really good feeling that I'm probably going to forget to talk about Egea Regriffin uh, enough to really satisfy myself into making sure that we understand what's going on here, because this is very important. Uh, and it seems as though I may, 
uh, in the future, which I totally haven't recorded yet when I do this, this future thing with Larry, <clears throat> that I'm not really going to emphasize my opinion on this. And I really want to make this very clear. G. Edward Griffin is a really cool guy. Uh, I know people who have met him on numerous occasions. Uh, I know people who know him uh, and he's a really cool guy from what I understand. Uh, I know people who really know him very, very deeply um, who I've talked to. Well, not really know, but I've, you know, that I, that I, that I have talked to about him and all of them have routinely con- like um, uh, confirmed my suspicions that he is not like any kind of anti-Semite whatsoever. I really want to make this very clear. However, uh, G. Edward Griffin has written his book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, which is kind of like the go-to kind of book when you're offering people kind of a counter uh, conspiracy narrative uh, regarding this thing. Um, but G. Edward Griffin seems to kind of rely a lot of his conspiracy theories based on other people's conspiracy theories that are anti-Semitic. His is not anti-Semitic, but the things that he is basing his stuff on is anti-Semitic uh, propaganda that is factually inaccurate. Um, I've seen G. Edward Griffin talk, uh, on, on, on various, uh, various, uh, different shows and podcasts uh, over the years. And I have never gotten the impression of that. And when I have talked to people who have known him, uh, you know, I've asked him like, I don't think G. Edward Griffin, uh, is an anti-Semite, but he still kind of like promotes like a lot of these kind of things, but the federal reserve and they're like, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I know him personally and no, he definitely is not. He definitely does. Uh, uh, he definitely is, uh, not, a, or definitely not an anti-Semite rather. Um, and you know, he, he has a lot of Jewish friends. He, 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 uh, he always works with other, other uh, you know, Jewish people, um, uh, in, in various kind of uh, libertarian circles. Cause there's a lot of Jews in libertarianism. Um, so I'm not definitely, I just want to make this 100% clear. We, I, could have talk about, I could be talking about it rather, uh, in the future in a, in a thing that I have not yet recorded, uh, where I talk about this, but I really wanted to make this 100% clear without a shadow of a doubt. The reason why we're going to go after a lot of these conspiracy theories is that when a lot of people are first confronted with these ideas that the federal reserve is a terrible, awful institution that needs to be abolished. Their first reaction is to think of people who are anti-Semitic, who do promote these kind of Illuminati stuff, uh, who do promote things that are very clearly historically inaccurate. Uh, and they immediately brush you off as a lunatic because the history of anti anti fed arguments has been a very ugly one. Uh, and it's not been very pretty and it's not been factually accurate in any way, shape or form. And it's unfortunate because there's a lot of good reasons to oppose the central bank, not just the federal reserve, but all central banks, uh, and any kind of institution that has a, a, a monopoly on the creation of, of funds, uh, and the dictation of interest rates. Um, and there's a lot of good resources, and I'll, put, I'll post a lot of the stuff in the description box as well. Uh, if you want to read some non-crazy v- critiques uh, of the Federal Reserve, and I highly suggest that you go check those out and try to shift your, even if you still believe in this stuff after it's all said and done, if, just try to shift your, your narrative not so much into it's an evil conspiracy because a lot of people are going to instantly go, you're fucking nuts, get the fuck away from me. Or at worst, you're an anti-Semite, you're a bigot, you're one of these alt-right fucks. Uh, so stay away from those types of things, you know? And let, hey, if, if you're an alt-right fuck, go ahead and use all these things uh, because, you know, the, the more you discredit yourself, the more the less I have to. Uh, not that I have to anymore because the alt-right is dead, but either way. But I just wanted to make this very clear why we're doing, why we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about in the latter half, right? Before we delve, uh, <laughs> before we get into the stuff, because this is, this is, this is really important. And I really want to emphasize again that, um, you know, talking about the federal reserve in the light of it's an evil conspiracy brought on by the Jewish bankers or brought on by the evil Rothschilds or brought on by the council of foreign relations, you know, who are really running the country or, you know, the reptilian that live in the center of the hollow earth or, uh, the people who are keeping the flat earth uh, a secret, um, 
when you talk about it in those kinds of terms, people are going to look at you like you're fucking crazy. And chances are, you just may be, right? <laughs> you, you just may be. Uh, or maybe you're not. Maybe you're just listening to these people and it sounds plausible, right? Because I believe these things. I believe these things for quite some time. And it wasn't until uh, I started talking to people who were not just anti-Fed conspiracy theorists, uh, but they or that's the wrong way of putting it. Anti-conspiracy theorists, uh, right? People who are anti-conspiracy theorists uh, who were also anti-Fed. Um, it was when I started talking to those types of people that they started cluing me into other things uh, and talks by other people as well. And I'm also going to post a link to, um, uh, if you're really interested in much more detailed Right, a much more detailed and much more complex version of what I just told you. If you really want the nitty gritty, if you want the the full resources and all and all that stuff, uh, because he cites all of his stuff, where I'm just kind of talking about things topically, uh, and then so giving you a bunch of sources in the description. If you really want a more detailed analysis of this stuff, I highly suggest you check out Stephen Horowitz's talk, um, and I'll link that as well. Uh, Do we really need a central bank? Uh, Because he delves into a lot of these kind of questions as well, but he doesn't really talk so much about the conspiracy angle and what's wrong with those. Rather, he just kind of talks about the history, and I think that the history was really important, right? Um, So... uh, Thank you all for, for staying, staying tuned through the, uh, the solo segment of it. Uh, we got through an hour, and now we're going to go on to Larry uh, into a segment which I have not yet recorded. So I will talk to you guys later. Shem Ham Farash. Hail Satan. Okay, so I had just got done uh, doing the first half of the po- uh, podcast by myself, and uh, now I have Larry on. How are you doing? I'm doing great. That first half of the podcast is really riveting, Jim. Right. And I I, uh, I already recorded it, and you were there listening to it as I recorded it, right? I was. It was yeah. really top tier and interesting. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to reiterate, reiterate what we already talked about, just so we can help set the table a little bit. Uh, just in case you may have missed something, because you definitely did hear what I said. So basically, I definitely heard what you said. So we basically talked a little bit about the history of the Fed, what the the situation on the ground was, what the perception of the people were at the time, uh, how the Fed basically operates, uh, and why it's uh, not particularly a good institution, uh, and why we don't need it. Uh, do you have those same uh, kind of sentiments? I'm. Sh- because you, you, you've listened to what I said in that More previous podcast and other things as well. I'm, I'm clearly not lying about this. No, uh, <laughs> no, he, J- Jim is totally not lying. And I, I have a slightly different perspective, but that's more because I've studied international relations. Okay. So I, I have a international I, relations perspective on it, but Jim's perspective is, well, you know, screw states. Let's not have them. Yeah. That way, none of those things are problems. <laughs> right, Jim? Uh, right. Well, right. Uh, but I'm talking, I'm trying to keep everything kind of localized to the Federal Reserve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, you yeah. kind of, you would classify yourself something like a minarchist, right? A small government Yes, guy. I believe that you need to have just enough government. Right. Not too much, not a little too much, just enough. I think that's also Hillary Clinton's position, but... No, she, she wants enough government to smother <laughs> people in their bathtubs and, and to pay them for it because that's okay. a vital you know, human right. Yes, but uh, I brought you on because uh, I know that you're very familiar with the the anti-Fed conspiracy theories about it. Um, but, you mean that the Jews are responsible for all the world's wars and use banks to destroy the world? Yeah, it's you know what I, I've heard this narrative before, uh, and I, I don't remember exactly what it was because the narration was in German. Uh, but either way, <laughs> um, we're going to kind of go through some of the things. Uh, the, but do you, do you agree that the Federal Reserve should be abolished, or that we need a central bank, or maybe it should be run differently? What's your perspective? I I believe a central this. bank is necessary in the current model of the economy. I, well, I believe that it's possible we can get into weird things with cryptocurrency at some point in time. I don't believe cryptocurrency is there yet. Yeah, I don't either. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential there, but uh, they need to work out a few of the kinks. Um, and they're working on them. So hey, I, I love I love cryptocurrency. I'm I'm not I'm not bashing it at all. I love it. Uh, but I think by the way, we need to get you your own branded cryptocurrency that's in bog form. <laughs> 
I'm down. If hey, if if anybody knows how to code, if anybody learned to code after they got fired from from the coal mines, and you want to create the uh, the Jim Jesus coin, uh, that's back in po- that's cryptocurrency that's back in Pog form, hit me up. We'll we'll do something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, but uh, so I definitely don't agree agree with you on uh, on the central bank, but I think we d- definitely do agree on one thing: is that these conspiracy theories uh, against the Federal Reserve. Um, uh, hurt the cause of trying to like argue against the Fed more than it helps uh, because it, people it, it look at you the and cause go, of trying crazy. to reform the broader economy of which you have to reform the Fed to reform the broader economy. Mm, okay, I think we we could we could abolish it, but anyway. Um, so I have a list of conspiracy theories, and um, and if you if you need to provide backstories behind any of these, go ahead and let me know. Uh, and I'm, I'm also going to help, too, because I already know the answers to all of these questions. Mm-hmm. But I thought it would be good to have a little bit of banter because there's yeah. there's some people that do like the Lulberts when I'm interacting with the co-host. And there's people who like it mm-hmm. when I'm doing just a solo episode. And so I'm trying to appease everybody here. But I had already explained that, as you heard in the first part of the recording, that I had clearly that's totally already, already had, happened. That's totally already happened. And that you heard the entire thing of. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so. um Let's kind of get into some of the things because I used two. Uh, there was a, a couple of videos that I used to kind of base my things around. Uh, it's been a very long time since I flipped through um, the creature from Jekyll Island, um, but I kind of flipped through some some various YouTube videos and uh, films, including the uh, the death of the American Dream, I believe what's what it's called. Um, well, it's the death of something. Yeah, it was the death of something. Death, death of my time. That's uh, what it was called. Uh, and I tried to catalog all of the conspiracy theories uh, about it that weren't really related to kind of the economics of it. So we're not going to be delving into like, you know, like, uh, you know, you know, is inflation good for the economy? Because we had already mm-hmm. done that, as you've heard. Um, so let's kind of get into it, I guess. So the first one that kind of keeps going around is like the Federal, the Federal Reserve is a secret organization that nobody can get into. They're not accountable well, to anybody well, at we, all in the federal government we, and not even well, God well, himself. Self can enter the Federal Reserve. Hold up, hold up. You mean buildings that are federal government buildings that you can access <laughs> on part of a guided tour? <laughs> sort of. Uh, that, okay, here, how about this? Let's start with this one instead, uh, because I think this one's more important. Is the is the Federal Reserve a private bank? It depends on your definition of the word private. <laughs> so here's what happens. Let's say, Jim, you have a bank. Right. And let's just say I'm your local Federal Reserve uh, District Bank. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you need money. And you can't get money from other banks or financial institutions, so you come to me. And I loan you out money. Now, you would be crazy to not have anything on the other side of the book sheet to insure yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So what I do to, you know, balance that book sheet and insure you is I give you a share of stock in the regional Federal Reserve Bank. Okay. Um, I think for Vegas, it's like San Francisco or Los Angeles, I think is where the regional Fed is for you guys, or maybe it's Denver. And so that means that you're a stakeholder there. You get to have meetings. You get to be involved in the things because you're one of the banks in that region. Now, do you know who appoints the boards of directors of that regional bank? Um, I know who, who appoints the, uh, the chair of the, of the Federal Reserve proper. It's also the president. Oh, it's also the Okay. So the president not so, only chooses the board uh, uh, of the Federal Reserve, but he also uh, chooses the governors as well of all the the member banks, yes. right? Okay. Uh, of, the, of the local banks. Those are selected by the president. Right. And this uh, is something that I would expect from a private institution. I don't know how many times like I've been appointed to run a company, a private company, uh, by, by the president, by, of, the by United the president States. of the United States. It, it's kind of annoying, um, but you know, hey, you got to do what you got to do for your country, right? Exactly. Right. Exactly. And. and um, so the ownership of the National Federal Reserve is all of the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And they have to shift money around back and forth between national and them. So again, they have shares of the National Federal Reserve Bank. And that's just a bookkeeping measure. Okay. So there is owners, but those ownerships are fiction used to manage money and to make sure money is properly balanced. Right. So um, the the other kind of aspect of it is, um, you know, the Federal Reserve is a secret institution, right? Uh, that's not accountable to anybody. 
um, you know, they're well, not I mean, accountable you know, to Congress you know, or anything like that. Uh, you mean other than the fact that the, the head of the Federal Reserve goes before Congress and testifies? And, I think he testifies, testifies under oath, doesn't he? Testifies under oath, okay, on a regular basis, mm-hmm. and also as needed, right? And uh, I know recently, uh, who's the current chair? Because they, they've they've changed the chair really, like a couple times oh, recently. Oh God, I don't even remember the uh, well, person's name. I mean, the it was last it was one Yellen. Obama appointed stepped out, and now the was, first one Trump appointed is in. And he's trying to mean girls uh, bully him into leaving. Yeah. Uh, he can actually fire them. And that was one of the threats that he issued. And, and yes. uh, a lot of the kind of people who were like, a lot of people were like, hey, we've never seen the president do this before. Can he do it? And a lot of legal scholars came in and were like, we looked at it and he can. It, it would basically be, the president would fire him. There'd be an immediate lawsuit over that. Mm-hmm. And it would be to define the role of the Federal Reserve in the broader federal hierarchy, though Trump could fire the head of the Fed and, and the Federal Reserve as an institution might decide against opposing that in court because they don't want to have it definitively decided in court. Right. Though there's also the question as to whether that would be handled at all by the court because that would be a political issue and that would be solely within the executive branch's jurisdiction. Yeah. So it may not even be constitutional for the court to rule on it. Yeah. So... Um... I mean, this is this all sounds like a private bank to me. Like I, I, I know, company, right? Right. Um, so yeah. Also, um, also here, here's here's another element to that. Okay. How, how does the Federal Reserve get uh, federal bonds, uh, Jim? Doesn't it buy them from the Treasury? Or, no. Uh, so if you're willing to put a check on something, I mean, I, I had already explained this in the previous thing. I'm just uh, it's, which actually has already happened. Which has which already happened. Heard. I'm just I'm just a little tired. So. <laughs> But yeah, so again, they have to go to a federal institution to buy the product that's necessary for them to do their job. But of course, they're not accountable to the federal government. Right. Because literally without bonds, the Federal Reserve Bank couldn't do its job. Right. Um, so, I mean, yes, they you know testify before Congress, have to buy and sell products from the Treasury Department, are appointed by the president are approved by the United States Senate as part of the appointment process. Banks have to buy shares. Subsidiary officers are appointed by the president. They issue shares to stakeholders and regional banks, but they're not accountable to anybody. (laughs) They're not accountable at all. But it is kind of important to say that, like, just because some, under the law, they're they're accountable to something, and maybe... Congress, you know, a lot of them are, are politicians, right? Their their expertise is more in law and uh, campaigning, more so than say, I don't know, uh, economics, deep uh, economic mm-hmm. issues. So, but also, a lot of times let, they just kind of go, "Do what you need to do. We trust you're doing the right thing." And let's get give really you the crazy, down. Jim. Let's okay. get really crazy. Yeah. Let's say you were the head of the Federal Reserve and you were fucking drunk. Okay. And you did some like all really the other dumb- ones, right? Like all the other ones, exactly. And you did some really dumb things with bond interest. You know what would happen, right? Other Federal Reserve banks would do things with buying and selling of U.S. bonds to try to curtail your choice in actions. So not only are they accountable to local banks, to Congress, to the president, to regional officers and all that, they're also accountable to other central banks. Mm Mm-hmm. But, but again, you know, it's a secret master plan organization controlled by the Jews. <laughs> right. We'll get to we'll get to the JQ in a bit, I guess. <laughs> the JQ, the Federal Reserve JQ, I guess. Um, yeah. So, yeah, uh, uh, we just sort of touched on this, but I kind of want to emphasize it just a little bit more. Uh, the Federal Reserve is a private bank and it's as federal as Federal Express. Except for the fact that, you know, the Federal Express has stockholders that aren't the government. Right. And uh, they have stockholders that vote on their officers, not Congress. Right. And I and do believe, the federal... and I, I do believe the actual company name of the company isn't Federal Express; it's FedEx. That, but Fed, that is it's correct. referring to uh, one of their lines that started the company, which was called the Federal Express. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but but either way, I mean that's just really kind of nitpicking, I guess. <laughs> and, appar- and apparently, the urban legend about FedEx being founded on a really good gambling binge in Las Vegas uh, is not true. Oh, I, I, I'm I'm always disappointed when when I find out roots of things aren't rooted in, into my uh uh my my newly acquired uh, hometown. What's well, not newly acquired? I've been here how long? Too long. Um. So yeah, yeah. The the Federal Reserve is is 
it's not ex- I'm not going to say that it's like completely 100% a government institution and all It's of- not as government yeah. as an institution as the military. Right. But it definitely is like a, as, as government as an institution as say Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or something like that. Uh, probably, or, probably more so than that. Or the federal pension insurance fund. Yeah. I mean, there, there's private elements to a thing, but it can still be uh, a, a state-run institution. Oh. And I do believe, and, and just to kind of reiterate, the Federal Reserve was created by an act of Congress. Uh, they, they testified signed by the president, signed by the president, the, the, the regional board of directors and the, uh, or the, the central bank, uh, governors and the chairman of the central bank, uh, the federal reserve is appointed by that. And it's approved by the Congress. I think the Senate as well. Senate. It's approved by the, approved Senate. by the Senate. Uh, and appointments are the exclusive domain of the Senate and they're accountable to Congress and they testify before Congress under oath all the time. Does that mean that they're holding them accountable? No, but it does mean under law <laughs> that in they are accountable. In theory, yeah. Congress is holding them accountable. Right, right. And it, I need to make that clear because I had actually debated someone about this, and they said, what do you mean? They do whatever they want, and Congress never does anything. It's like, well, that's not entirely true, but let's say that it was. It's It still, still doesn't refute what I'm saying because under the law. In they, practice, yeah. Congress is a bunch of lazy, shiftless, no goods. Yeah. Who to thunk it, right? <laughs> uh so yeah uh let's let's get into uh the, the big question is uh the federal reserve is unconstitutional except for you know it was uh passed by an act of congress mm-hmm. signed by a president and it's congress taking one of its powers to regulate money and currency and that, creating that's delegated an under, to manage that that's that's relegated under uh, article one section eight of the constitution yeah all right. Where uh, it also says that uh, Congress can relegate these powers to other agencies. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. Uh, there was also a Supreme Court case that was decided in ni- 1819. And I'm trying to pull up the exact court case that decided nine to one. Uh, let's see. 1819 Supreme Court. Here, banter for a bit while I look this up. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> Did you know? That the Jews are responsible for all the world's wars? <laughs> if you knew that, you may have voted for Ron Paul. Do, 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 I think this do, is it. The, uh, the Maryland versus... Uh, or McCulloch Marbury versus, versus Maryland? Yep. McCulloch versus Maryland. McCulloch versus Maryland. Yeah. Go a second. It's one of the... Let me, uh, the let's see. Do, do, do. Here we go. Right. So McCulloch Summary. versus Maryland, 1819, is one of the first and most important Supreme Court cases in federal power. In this case, the Supreme Court held that Congress has implied powers derived <clears throat> from the from those listed in Article One, Section Eight. Uh, the Necessary and Proper Clause gave Congress the power to establish a national bank. On this page, you will find there's different things, blah blah blah, and it basically kind of talks about it. So, and this this was this court ruling was ruled nine to zero. Mm-hmm. And that's important to kind of say that when you're talking about how um, how how cases are decided, what the ruling, what the ca- uh, what the vote count was, right? I guess that's not the, well, the ruling count. The comedy judge agreed with that because the Supreme Court. Uh, a lot of people like to think that oh no, these are these are people who who put aside their their political beliefs and and uh, um, you know judge the law according to how they see fit. Um, they don't, they're very much pol- a political institution, just like any other ones. Uh, and they usually tend to disagree with each other. And that's why you see rulings like, I think the gay marriage court, it was a split decision with Kennedy <coughs> being the deciding vote. Um, mm-hmm. this is not and the case. They un- unanimously rule. agreed that, that this was constitutional. Yeah. And, and a, a related Supreme court case that happened just as recently as 10 years ago is United States v. Com- Comstock. Okay. And let me just pull that up here so I can just uh, read a little summary for uh, everybody out there. On May 17th, 2010, the Supreme Court, vote, by a vote of 7 to 2, held that the Necessary and Proper Clause granted Congress the authority to enact 18 U.S.C. 4248, which authorizes the civil commitment of dangerous sexual predators after they complete federal prison sentences. Originally four men whose confinement was supposed to end over two years ago challenged the provision of the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act which was passed in 2006 in the 4th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, the court ruled that the provision was unconstitutional, arguing that Congress did not possess the authority to hold sexually dangerous inmates indefinitely. While the petitioners challenged the Adam Walsh Act on a number of grounds, including double jeopardy clause, the ex post facto clause, and the 6th and 8th Amendment, 
the Supreme Court limited its ruling to the narrow question of whether Congress, under Article One of the Constitution, had the authority to enact civil commitment program. So that clause gives Congress broad authority to uh, do anything that they deem necessary and proper within their other constitutional powers. Okay. So this has been, for 200 years, well-established federal legal precedent. Okay. And I think it's also important point out because most of the audience that I, that I talk to, there's, 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 I know that there's a lot of like um, big government types of people. I know there's like liberals that listen to it. I, I know that there's, I've, I've pretty much driven off all the alt right people. <clears throat> um, but I know there's a lot of like conservatives, and I know I also mm-hmm. have a lot of uh, Marxists and whatever. They like to listen in because I usually like to bash libertarians, and so they just want to get the inside scoop on things. Um, yeah, those guys <laughs> suck. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I you know I have a, I have a lot of people that listen to it like that, and um, you know th- when you're talking about like the the constitutionality of it, <clears throat> for the most part, most of my audience are ANCAPs, and it's kind of mm-hmm. weird to hear ANCAPs complain about things being quote unquote unconstitutional. And I've done it in the past. Uh, I've since kind of been like, you know what, whatever. I don't really care because at the end of the day, let's talk about some of the things that were constitutional. Um, uh, maybe up not not anymore, but definitely some things that were constitutional back in the day. Jim Crow laws, slavery, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. post office that uh, failed to deliver my book you about mean, how to take the down the government on multiple you mean the occasions. Post it's still constitutional to this very day. It's, it's it is constitutional. Oh, I, I know that. It's, it's still constitutional because <laughs> yeah. it's still in there. Yeah, there's there's lots of things in the Constitution that a lot of people would disagree with. Just because something is constitutional doesn't mean that it's good and i remember there was a a youtuber back in the day where uh he was a libertarian he's he's since gone away because he he went on the show called the uh, the hate club i think it was called the hate club Mm -hmm. um and he uh like anytime he didn't like something uh he would just say oh that's unconstitutional that's unconstitutional and they're like no 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 slavery was constitutional uh and until you know until they uh, amend the constitution to say that it's no longer constitutional uh, but our, our broader point of talking about why this is constitutional is this is an argument being made against it, and it's a specious argument. Right, yeah. If you want to argue that the Federal Reserve isn't good policy, make that argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because it clearly is. Uh, there's been multiple court cases ruled on it. It fits into the legal definition of anybody who understands what, what's going on here would say, yes, this is constitutional. But just because it's constitutional doesn't make it good. <laughs> um, anyway, so moving along. Uh, only the Fed can make money, or only um, the Federal Reserve no. has the power to make and coin money. No, um, here's what's hilarious about that: the United States Department of the Treasury, during a recent uh, issue where the federal government couldn't pass a budget, said, "You know, what? we're just going to make some platinum coins yep. and use that to pay the government's debt." I think uh, Paul Krugman even said, "Hey, look." Here's an idea, which I think he was repeating other people at the time. He's saying, why don't the, the Treasury print uh, or mint a one trillion dollar coin and then and pay then that in its bank? Yeah. And then pay it to itself. They could do yeah. that. They have the power to 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 coin money and regulate the value there. Now, asterisk, 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 that would cause massive inflation. Right. And that would be bad. <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying that this is a good policy. I'm just saying. If the Federal That's Reserve, a policy government could do. Yeah. If, if the Federal Reserve was the only institution that was allowed to print or coin money, uh, they would not be allowed to do that. The, the Treasury, as I understand, can still print silver certificates. Uh, they just can't print Federal Reserve notes. Right. Is that correct? That is correct. OK. So there we go. Uh, now, but, Jim, have you be ever been to a little Reserve. place called Disney World? Yes. Do you know they have this thing called Disney Bucks? Mm hmm. Disney Bucks are good for. All uh, debts, public and private, within Disney World. Right. So, isn't that somebody creating money illegally? Well, hold on. Let's let's get right into that one because that's another one that I had. Uh, So let's see. We scroll down here a bit. We'll we'll jump it a little bit. Uh, if anyone did with the federal, Re- this is another one. So if the federal reserve did any, uh, if the federal, Re- if we did any of the things that the federal reserve does, i.e. print money or loan money with interest, we would be put in jail and for good reason, because it's you, you illegal, mean- illegal counter or because what the federal reserve is doing is illegal counterfeiting. You mean what mines did across the United States for decades mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, what Disney does? Right. And what what cryptocurrency is, it's basically what cryptocurrencies do, what people who are into alternate currencies do. 
Yep. And if you mine those cryptocurrencies, you're creating money. But we don't say that that's also, counterfeiting because the important also, thing about counterfeiting is that it's fraudulent. So if I were to yes. do a 51 percent attack on, on a cryptocurrency and mm -hmm. uh, relegate all of the all of the currency over to me, that would be I guess in a form count or have my account have, have fraudulent funds that would be counterfeiting. Uh, if also, the have you heard Reserve, this little, if the federal reserve has the power to create federal reserve in any capacity and they do that in that capacity, it's not counterfeiting because they're printing mm -hmm. the money that they have the authorization to print. So therefore it can't be fraudulent. It's kind of like saying that well, like I'm, I'm counterfeiting my own t-shirts, my own Lulbert's t-shirts. It's like, no, I'm making them. <laughs> Also, Jim, have you heard of a little thing called Barter Bank? What is this? So Barter Bank is an exchange that exists in many communities across the country where small businesses agree whenever possible. They pay for things in exchanges of goods and or services through barter with other small businesses in the network. Okay. So we're, we're, we're even going to pre-money. And that's a thing that is completely... with you know oh, an internal on. credit hold system on, which on, is basically on. money hold on you might want to repeat that last bit uh, all over again because uh i've had having computer issues lately <laughs> okay so that we go you know it's amazing how you didn't have those computer issues when we record that part earlier right anyway so what a barter bank does is two small businesses agree that they're going to exchange their goods and, and or services to other small businesses in the network as a method of payment mm -hmm. And the barter bank does bookkeeping to keep records of who's exchanged what for what, which is essentially ones and zeros as a form of money, just like real banks do. Mm -hmm. So again, there's private money everywhere. Yeah. Why is private money not more popular? Because not everybody takes private money. Everybody takes the Federal Reserve note that says, good for all debts, public and private. Yeah. And by law, you have to accept. If you're in the United so, States, you have to accept Federal Reserve notes. Though, if you are in a private enterprise, you can refuse payment in obscene numbers of pennies. Yeah. Oh, I, th I thought that was... Uh, I, I know that government institutions can't re uh, refuse those or anyone right. that's... Uh, like, if you're paying a fine to a uh, to a, uh, a, a tow cut, like, let's say someone tows your car, yeah. a private company tows your car, but it was for a government reason, you they have to accept your pennies. And a lot right. of tow truck companies and stuff now, because they're ready for this have uh, have bean counters now like there's yep. automatic bean counters so and they charge people a fee for using them yeah uh, but just still so it's funny because it still harasses them. <laughs> so again private money exists has existed for decades mm -hmm. and uh if we want to go back to the dawn of the republic there's this little thing you might have heard of called moonshine which existed also as a alternate form of money yeah and the only reason that moonshiners got in trouble with the government is they didn't pay their taxes. And there was a period in the United States, I think it was during the free banking era, era which uh, I talked about in the, in the podcast, which you heard because we just did it. Uh, we just did it. Just did it. Um, where the uh, where at the time, most of the people were trading local bank, uh, local bank notes. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, you would deposit your money in, in a bank in hard coins, and the and the and the banks would offer you um, like receipt cert or certificates of receipt, so you can go and and pay those. Uh, you know, if someone wanted the gold out of the bank, they can go and grab it. But people just use those as uh, currency, uh, and that was happening mm -hmm. in the United States while we had uh, you know the federal government, right? Uh, <laughs> and they were perfectly okay with that. So I mean. Historically and currently, that is not the case. Um, you can use bit, uh, Bitcoin. You can use Bitcoin Cash. You can use Zcash. You can use Monero. All that stuff. All of those, all of them were created uh, not by governments. I think actually, I think the Federal Reserve is looking into like creating blockchain networks in order to help them kind of uh, keep track of, of who's doing what. Um, but and also some some private banks are doing that as well. I know what was it? I think J.P. Morgan actually hired some of the guys from Zcash. Uh, mm -hmm. To help them uh, kind of make sure that or to have like a system, it's based. They're not creating their own cryptocurrency. What they're doing is they're creating a blockchain network so they can better track what's going on. Walmart's doing the similar thing. Um, this is this is happening all, all over the place. So I mean, also Jim, do you remember a little Christmas movie that came out in the summer called Die Hard? <laughs> no, because it wasn't a Christmas movie. But I remember the yes. summer action flick that came out that summer. 
So, do you remember what the key plot device of the movie Die Hard was? Uh, it was uh, trying to steal money from a bank. Not money. Bearer bonds. Oh, bearer bonds. Do you, do you know what a bearer bond is? Why don't you tell me what a bearer bond is? A bearer bond is a bond that can be exchanged with a financial institution for money, making it as good as money and an alternate form of money used for payments in high-income transactions. Nice. So that's yet another form of alternatives to government money. It's not, now that I think about it, that's actually kind of a really bad. Couldn't they actually track those? That would. No, they do. That's part of the part of the uh, features of bearer bonds. Oh. So Hans Gruber wasn't really a, a really smart guy at the end of the day, I guess. No, he wasn't. No. Okay. But you know. <laughs> it's still a great summer action flick. Great it summer is. action flick. And definitely not a Christmas movie. <laughs> so, here, let's moving along. The system of the Federal Reserve is a closely guarded secret. Okay. I think... You, you, uh, you, you mean the system of the Federal Reserve that's uh, detailed in textbooks? It's also... Yeah, it's detailed... And on Wikipedia? And, and the Federal and, Reserve website? Yeah. You know? Uh, <laughs> they tell you in great detail, like, all about it, if you're really interested in, in digging into how they operate... You can find out. And in fact, as you've heard uh, me record earlier uh, in that stuff that definitely happened earlier, um, I went into great detail about how it operates. Not completely now, detail the because thing, I, I don't I don't want to bore the shit out of you, all of you guys. But now, um, the big thing that's oh, important I, I didn't that, want to bore the shit out of you guys because it already happened. Yeah. Yeah. But the big thing that's important about how the Federal Reserve does its business is it does delay certain information because – it doesn't want certain people to exploit that information out of privilege. Mm -hmm. It wants that information to be equally as accessible to everybody so they can all act upon it equally. Right. Which is something a private institution wouldn't do because a private institution would totally exploit its advantages over other institutions. Right. Well, to be fair, the, the Federal Reserve kind of does that. I mean... <laughs> Sort of, um, ish. But but I mean, it's it's uh, to to say that like this is a closely guarded guarded secret that no one knows what's going on. I mean, like they lay out all the details. They do reports all the time. They explicit. They testify in Congress and tell you know tell Congress exactly yeah. what they did for that fiscal quarter every single. Basically, quarter, the only like thing is that they say yeah, and the basically they say is like they will delay certain reports because if people knew about them right away. That allows certain people to take disproportionate advantage, and that would disturb the entire economy. Right. So, like, let's say that I'm a person that trades money on the, um, you know, on the, uh, the on the on the on the monetary exchange, right? So I'm I'm buying and selling dollars, and I'm converting them over to to euros, and I'm transferring them yeah. over to to rubles because you know I'm I'm, I'm a speculator market, and then I hear. You know, I you know, like uh, I find out that you know, oh, the Federal Reserve is going to do another round of quantitative easing. What am I going to do? I'm going to dump all of my U.S. dollars into other things uh, until you know the the. the no, the that's not what you would do. Oh, so let me tell you a little story. Oh, okay. <laughs> so let's say you are a central bank. You're responsible for keeping, if you're not Japan, the United States, the European Union, and China, kind of, sort of, but not really. You're responsible for keeping a balance of those four major currencies in your basket. So you can hold it in currency, which is subject to the fluctuation of the market, or you can hold it in bonds, which is subject to the fluctuation of the bond market. So do you want to hold U.S. dollars that are going to go down in value, or do you want to hold U.S. bonds that are going to go up in yield as the dollar goes down in value? Okay. Well... Yeah. So, but but you can kind of get the idea of what I'm trying to say <laughs> from that, even though I'm because I'm not a monetary speculate spec speculator. Yeah. Uh, but so. the real trick isn't the monetary speculation. So, the base rate for the Fed for interest rates impacts how you know banks and other institutions set their interest rates, mm -hmm. and in turn that affects how you know little things called health insurance companies work, housing companies work, so on and so forth. So. A lot of things are all very sensitive to changes in Fed policy. Yep. So, also, if I was uh, if I was uh, in the uh, in the in Wall Street, probably not a good idea. Or I could I could basically make, or maybe not, I don't know if it's a good idea or a bad idea because I don't really know the ins and outs of banks and, and speculative more uh, <laughs> in stock markets regarding that. 
But I could say like, oh, okay, because I know that Bank of America is going to have access to all this cheap, uh, cheap money for loans and lower interest rates or higher interest rates, I can buy and sell loans or buy and sell stocks based on what I think they're going to be doing with that money that's going to be uh, even smarter than that market, even smarter than that. I'm going to kick quantitative easing to Bank of America. Bank of America is going to invest in commodities, which will have a higher and quicker return on investment, which they're required to do by their stockholders, mm -hmm. which in turn will drive up the prices on commodity-based stocks. Okay. But yeah, you get the idea. And then, But later, after we find out, oh, but so what happens really... We don't know. All this stuff happens, and then they let us know that's what they did, uh, and then they yes. release a report when it's delayed, and then I can go look at it and go, oh, so that's why my Bank of America stock went up. Uh, but it also, but the idea that it's a it's a secret thing and that no one's allowed to do it, it's not. Uh, oh, here's another one. This is not on my list. Um, the Federal Reserve has never been audited, and except you know more about this the, than I do. <laughs> except for the times it, it was actually audited. Oh, okay. By, by the law that got passed that said audit the Fed. Yeah. Oh, did it get passed? I thought it. <laughs> yeah. The one that Bernie Sanders and Ron Paul did. I thought I'm not sure if that one passed. Uh, but I, I, from what I understood, I think you've you've told you've talked about this to me, and I'm not too familiar with it. So I'm basically just asking you, um, mm -hmm. is that there's been instances where um, the Federal Reserve or the Federal Reserve have been audited by Congress? Not so much audited by Congress, but okay. they've been audited by the executive branch okay. because Congress doesn't have auditors. Oh, uh, okay. They do have sort of kind of auditors, but the the better auditors work for the Government Accountability Office. Right, so the GAO, which, by the way, the GAO, if I were to, if you were to ask me, like Jim, mm -hmm. you have to choose what government agency you like the most. What would it be? The GAO would be it. Oh, also, by the way, prior to <laughs> that little language being added into federal law, Government Accountability Office already audits and has audited the Federal Reserve every year. Okay. The Federal Office of the Inspector General audits them every so often as needed. There's an internal Inspector General that does audits. Uh, every local bank gets audited by the Fed itself. Okay. So again, that's that's a not true scenario. Okay, so uh, moving along? Yeah. Okay, so moving along. Uh, the meeting on Jekyll Island was secret. No one knew about it, and everybody there had secret code names to protect their identity. So let's let, let's first use our brains before we talk about how all that's fake, too. Okay. <laughs> let's say you're going to pass a major sweeping form of government law. Mm -hmm. It's going to affect the entire freaking economy. Now, you're not the government, so you're not required to have people be there. But you want to meet with other major stakeholders and saying, hey, I think we need to do this. We need to plan out and come up with a strategy before we go to the government. That is a logical course of action because you don't want people hamming it up to the media and doing all sorts of other nonsense. Yeah. And then you have people going on and sit, talking about it in the newspapers and on the, yeah. radio, the radio. Was a radio thing in 1910? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, so let's, if it was whatever, let's, uh, you know, you have all these people talking about it, uh, and then going like, "Oh, this is terrible. This is awful. Oh, this is great. This is going to be great." And every, you know, people don't get what they want. There's all kinds of riots in the streets, and you know, people aren't getting unelected. It's not a good thing. So what you do is you so, you, you debate these things in private, just like any law. They kind of debate, they yeah. kind of finer deep details in it. They uh, they end up going to to people who are relevant in the industries to their to they're talking to, uh, which is kind of important talking point amongst libertarians when we talk about regulations. Because one of the things mm -hmm. that a lot of libertarians will tell you is that a lot of these regulations. Um, that get passed, you know, what, by whatever, are usually ones that are being pushed uh, by the corporations in that industry. So you'll mm -hmm. see things like Walmart, you know, lobbying for higher minimum wages. Why? Because they 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 can afford the uh, they can afford the overhead to pay a little bit more to make sure that other corporations uh, would take a bigger hit if they had to pay that mm -hmm. minimum wage, or uh, they would create. Um, all these regulatory hurdles that they can afford to to, uh, to to comply with, but they know that the com competition can't do it as well. Um, so, the, you know, the Congress does come to them because they're fucking mm -hmm. idiots and they don't know what they're doing. And they say, hey, we're fucking idiots. We don't know what we're doing, uh, but we definitely want to do something. Uh, so can you help us out uh, to do something? And a lot of these industry experts are like, excellent. Uh, and they help them. Uh, and they have these meetings and they're in private at first. And then they usually come out and say, 
you know, hey, this is our bill. This is how we passed it. And if you're interested, we can tell you the whole story about it, which had happened because Paul Warburg ended up do, writing a book about the meeting on Jekyll Island. And what was not in that book? What was one of the things they mentioned th- that he didn't mention in that book? That was a, uh, the big talking point. Among, oh, yeah, they were using code names because that's just something that they made up. No. And also they said, oh, it's all the big bosses were there. Uh not Except, exactly. of course, it wasn't the big bosses. Yeah. They, they had guys who were there. Yeah. They had guys who worked for them because uh, they were busy doing other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a couple of people, uh, major people who showed up. Uh, but for the most part, there was just like representatives from those banks and uh, things. Mm-hmm. There was also an economist that was there. Um, yeah. A couple of regional bank type people. Um, I think a senator. I think, I think a couple of senators was there. I had already yeah. talked about this in the in the previous episode and who attended, uh, which you yeah. just heard. I just kind of completely forgot because we're on to a different subject now. Because exactly. I totally recorded it. All right. So, but that that's the whole thing that happened is a bunch of businesses decided, hey, instability in the banking sector is bad for us. Mm-hmm. We need government action to take uh, shape to do that, and we're going to unite together as a group of businesses who need a functional economy to exist three years after a Great Depression, basically. And they met with smart people who were stakeholders and part of the system knew what they were doing, and then they proceeded on a three-year campaign. I think it was three years. I think it was five. Of lobbying. Well, it was 1910, and it didn't pass until 1913. But, but the I think the... the... I think the the thing was not 1907. I have to look it up. The meeting was well, 1907 was the big crash. Okay, that's right. So it took about five years from that because at the time, you have to remember, as we've talked about before, is that the the sentiment among among Americans were, look, this quote unquote free bank system, the free enterprise in banking, uh, is a terrible fucking idea, and we need to abolish it. Even though it wasn't free banking uh, as we would call it today, uh, but it definitely. Uh, you know, was not good. There was a lot of regulations and stuff like that, but people had the false impression of the misdiagnosis of what it was and their solution kind of unanimously amongst uh, most Americans in the progressive era was we should have the, we should bring back a central bank uh, to, to fix all these things and have a federal reserve, which is why it's called the federal reserve of money. So that in case there's a, a bank run uh, there's, there could be a lender of last resort. That's why they needed it. <laughs> so, idea. Mm-hmm. Sorry, you cut out. What was that? Blender of last resort. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. Blender of last resort is what now? Because you know, if everything goes to hell, and you're running a society, we don't currently live in a society, but we might want to live. You might in want one. to hold on. Start. Start all over again. So. <clears throat> A lender of last resort is a logical idea because if you want to live in a society that's functional, sometimes you need to have a quick influx of capital and you may not be able to deal with uh, some of the consequences of a lack of liquidity. Mm -hmm. I have money to fix stuff. Yep. And by the way, I need to reiterate again, just in case you started needle dropping, we're not, I, I'm not, maybe you are, I am not advocating for a central bank. Uh, we're just saying that was the sentiment of the people at the time. And, and I'm not so much advocating for it. I'm saying the fundamental principle of a lender of last resort is a logical idea. I'm not saying the Federal Reserve is the best way to do that. I'm saying it's a logical idea to have a functional banking system. All right. So the next one I'm going to look up while you while um while you're talking. Uh-oh. While we're talking about things that uh, we totally did earlier in the video that we both listened to that because it actually happened. Right. Right. All right. So the next one is the Federal Reserve was an act snuck into law the day before Christmas Eve when all Except, of the con- you know, well hold on uh, when all of the Congress critters and senators were at home getting drunk. Except, you know, it was campaigned on by the Democratic Party twenty in 1912. And the president said he was going to sign it into law. That That's the opposite of being snuck in. All right. So uh, so it was introduced in the House uh, on August 29th, 1913. Uh, they had a, a committee uh, consideration hearing. Um, it passed on the House uh, or it passed on the House in September. Um, it passed the Senate in, in December 18th. Uh, reported by uh, reported by the Joint Commission 
conference committee hearing on December 22nd, 1913, agreed by the House on December 22nd, and then it was signed into law on Christmas Eve Eve, which is December 22nd, In other words, 1913. the president signed it on the literal last moment he could sign it after it was being passed. Right. Because this is this is the policy that he ran for president on. This was not some well, secret thing. <laughs> one, of, one of the things that, yeah, one of many awful things that he was running on. Um, also, um, I believe Teddy Roosevelt was also in favor of a central bank, right. too. A lot of people were in, in favor of a central bank because it was the progressive era, and this is a progressive policy. And because it was a press, <laughs> progressive policy in the progressive era, the press, progressives wanted it. Uh, they were demanding for it, and they voted, they voted for someone into office who was going to achieve that goal. So this was not some sort of... And it thing. happened. And it happened. Go fucking it, figure. Democracy worked. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to do a thing. Vote for this person. Does the thing. Democracy works. Uh, I, I was. I people did, did vote for sarcasm. Donald Trump because he was uh, a non-interventionist. That didn't work out. Well, no, but that's not why people <laughs> vote for Donald Trump. They voted for him because he was going to build a wall, and he's kind of sort of doing that. Yep. Sort of. Ish. We'll see. He's He's got plenty of time, I guess. Um, a lot of people are upset and... Uh, they're voting for Yang, but that's a that's a whole another topic for a whole other show. It's because they want to get their bag, <laughs> secure their bag, secure your bag. And you bag. know the easiest way to secure your bag is to have a Federal Reserve Bank. <laughs> it's the only way. <laughs> All right, that's how they get you. Yeah, so I mean, it was it was it was on the House. They 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 voted on it. Uh, what it was the final vote on this thing? Um, it was like a 55-ish percent margin, if I remember correctly. But, but how many people voted for it? Because remember, as we're told, uh, that it was snuck into law second. without their without their approval, right? And uh, so most of them were The at House vote was lopsided. It was 29-60. Senate vote was 43-25. Oh, here we go. So pass the House. So, so was, 287. So, that's what I'm saying. Here we go. Uh, 287 to 85, only five were present. So that was kind of the thing that they, they kind of, the, the conspiracy theories are looking at. They're like, how could 287 people vote for it and 85 people vote against it when only five people were there? So, so here's let's a funny explain thing. how mafia works. Here's the funny thing. In old timey days, they weren't necessarily members of Congress actually in Washington all the time. Mm-hmm. They voted a little differently. They they voted like you know, with like here's my vote. I'm mailing it in. Yeah, and you got to remember that plane travel was really more expensive than it is today. Well, actually, there was barely any plane travel back yeah, in yeah. 1913. Yeah, unless you want so to they, go to you know, like boats or trains, mm-hmm. or if they're close by, horse and carriage. Yeah, I, I believe yeah. there was some sort of thing that happened around this time. Um, I think it would actually happen in, in the time frame that, you know, bef- the recession. You mean the plans? No, I mean, um, there was uh, in the time that, you know, between the, 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 at that time, it was called the Great Depression. It's not called the Great Depression anymore, obviously. Because um, I, well, I also, wanted, I also wanted to point that thing Depression. out. You did say, like, the Great Depression. Uh, it's, <laughs> it was a Great Depression. At the time, yes. it was the big greatest depression. Uh, we didn't get another one until after the Federal Reserve passed. I just well, I mean, we, yeah. could, we could argue, we could argue the crash after the destruction of the First Bank right. of the United States was bigger. But it's kind of hard to argue that because of the complexity of the economy then versus now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, um, but there was there was a major event that that took place between all of this stuff happening. In fact, the year before uh, the Federal Reserve back passed, uh, where a bunch of people died in the middle of the fucking ocean uh, because some jackass said like, "Hey, my boat ain't gonna sink. Why do we need lifeboats?" Yeah. Boats? Um, oh yeah, that was and, a, uh, it. It made uh, James Cameron the king of the world. Yeah. <laughs> so back in those days, if you wanted to travel across, across long distances of, uh, uh, of the world, a lot of the time you took a boat because planes were really expensive. And as you can imagine, um, boats are cheaper than traveling on land. So if you mm. live in, let's say, I don't know, California, and you want, and you were a Congress critter, right? Um, you were, uh, you, are you going to killed. travel back and forth from Washington, D.C. To, to your home state to to campaign? and all? No, you're not, because it's going to cost you way too much to do that. You and basically you have to die. get on a train. Yeah, or a train or something like that. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not good. It's just not good. 
So a lot of times, a lot of congressmen aren't there, and they usually just mail their votes in. They they see all this stuff, they have a debate. If they think it's relevant for their thing, they'll come back and have a debate on the House floor to try to argue that, hey, this is a bad bill to pass, or hey, this is a good bill to pass, and then they all vote on it, and there you go. And then they get Also, all by the way, meetings. you ever watch C-SPAN 2, Jim, and you see members in the Senate debating back and forth to each other? Mm-hmm. You know how many of them are in the room at the time that debate's happening? Like two. No, one. Okay. And then the other guy who's going to counter him shows up towards the end of the speech, and then he leaves and doesn't listen to the other guy. Mm-hmm. That is a thing. Like, there are very rarely a large number of senators in the Senate hall. Yeah. All right, so let's move along. I think we, we got that one. Um, here we go. Taxes that, the, the taxes that you pay don't go to government services. They all go to the bankers who run the Fed. And this is a no. complex one uh, because when we're complex, talking about, but the answer is still no. Yeah, the answer is still no. Uh, but let's let's tackle the easy ones out of the gate. Uh, when you go to the store and you buy a pack of cigarettes, right? You, you're going to pay mm-hmm. for uh, you're going to pay for sales tax. You're going to pay for tobacco tax. You're going to pay for your state tobacco pa- tax. You're going to pay for you know th- through the through the uh, through the the profit margin. Uh, you're going to be paying for the the taxes on the the corporations who are producing and selling it to you and all that other stuff, right? Yes. Um, so there's many different avenues of all these tax things, but the corporate tax, the income tax, tobacco tax, and all this other stuff isn't going to the Federal Reserve and has nothing to do with them. They're completely out of that picture completely. That goes straight to the treasuries of either your state or maybe your your city, your <clears throat> county, your state, uh, yeah. and the federal government and various things, right? So that has nothing to do with that. And those, those are all supposed to go to, quote, unquote, government services, unquote. Uh, right. I, I, services. Um, but anyways, um, so let's get so, that one out of the bed. Let's, let's, let's get to real ta- yeah. tax and call. And then we're going to talk so, about income tax because that's what they're really talking about when they say this. Uh, but let, let's, let's put all that on the shelf and let's, you know, not be stupid. <laughs> right. So the Federal Reserve provides a service for the federal government. Mm-hmm. So that means that we're paying them to provide a service. That, that That's, you know, a basic thing. Mm-hmm. It's not a service also, you want, but it's a service you get. Also, they manage sales of federal treasury bonds, and they hold auctions and things like that. So, in turn, for holding and managing the treasury bonds, as you do, that means that whenever our government has to pay for a debt, they send the money for that debt to the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve then sends that money out to everybody who holds a bond. Some of it is the Federal Reserve, so it gives money back to itself. Some of it is China and other foreign countries. Most of it is people like your grandma or the bank that's giving you a loan or your health insurance company. So a small percentage of the yield on bonds goes to the Federal Reserve Bank and an operational fee goes to the Federal Reserve Bank. You know where all the rest of your tax money goes to? Wherever else the federal government throws it. Yep. There you go. Now, remember <laughs> what I said earlier about how f- central banks have to be responsible for managing their balance sheet? Mm-hmm. As you do. Well, the Federal Reserve has to decide whether it makes more sense to make more money on dollars from holding debt or make more money on dollars from holding dollars. So when the Federal Reserve gets paid more money by the government, it's because the government does policies that makes the dollar value weaker and the value of holding debt stronger. So again, that's not the Federal Reserve taking your tax money. That's your government throwing your tax money in the garbage. Yeah. It's also, I think, a little disingenuous because uh, there was a film called um, America Freedom to Fascism. Are you familiar with this one? Vaguely. Yeah, your, your old buddy used to used to promote this uh, this video back in the day. Our buddy Ron? No, your buddy, <laughs> your buddy Ian. Ian oh, Freedom. Ian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where in the film they were they were talking about like oh all of your all the money that you pay uh, goes directly to the Federal Reserve or to pay off the interest on the national debt to the uh, Federal Reserve. You, you know who who I heard that first from hmm. a, a good friend of ours, Mister Lyndon Larouche. May he rot in hell. <laughs> yeah, may he rot in hell. Uh, the, yeah, pr- press F to, to to pay your disrespects. Oh, I'm going to drink a little <laughs> bit of Lafroig for that. <laughs> so. This is a burning common hospital and it's delicious. <laughs> this is a common thing 
conspiracy theorists teach you to make you distrust your government. Yep. There are plenty of positive reasons to distrust your government. This is not one of them. Right. A lot of really great ones. A lot of them. As, as we pointed out earlier with regulations and the, uh, and the corporations working with the state to, to enact them, there's lots of reasons to distrust it. You don't need to make ones up. There, there's a lot of really great ones. Um, but yeah, but in this film, they also said uh, they were saying things like all that money goes to that. Uh, and you can tell because all of the money that, you know, that it collects is in income taxes is is almost the same amount that they paid for the interest on the on the national debt. And, uh, you know, if you're saying like, well, what about what about military? It's like, well, you know, the military, if you if you calculate straight over, um, you know, the, the corporate tax can do it. So all of your money goes to that. And it's like, well, that's completely disingenuous because, as you know, money is fungible. Right. So what you're saying that if I put a giant pile of money into a in knowing which dollar is going where? Right. Jim. Right. So this is this is one of the arguments for like Planned Parenthood, because Planned Parenthood is not allowed to use tax dollars for abortions. So they give money and they say wait, you can't wait, use wait, a single I'm dollar. Totally spending this federal money on counseling you on good nutrition for your children. Yeah. Wink, wink, wink. Yeah. And uh, all that money for abortions that we're spending on. Oh, that's from this pile of money that we're getting it from. So, I mean, money is oh, fungible. Also, it goes back and forth. Yeah. Also, the, these food stamps aren't for Pablo, who's an illegal alien. No, it's for his son, right? who's an American citizen because he was born here. Right. We're not spending welfare money on illegal aliens. Wayne Quinn. Right. So you, you kind of get the idea. Money is fungible. Um, and, and to try to say that just because you know the amounts are similar and they can go in different places doesn't mean that, well, they're taking your money <sighs> and then they're taking that dollar and saying, well... You know, that dollar is going directly to the Federal Reserve. We're not going to pay for, for uh, roads and we're not going to pay for uh, highway construction and we're not going to pay for this, that or the other well, because here's, that's here's, not coming from the right source. But also, here's an important thing. Let's say you're a state government mm -hmm. and you want to finance bonds. Now, let's say your state government doesn't necessarily have a good uh, history with uh, paying back its money. Like a state like, I don't know, Illinois... California. Well, what you might do as a state is buy a certain amount of federal bonds and use the yield from those bonds to securitize your state bond, which means that the Federal Reserve paying Illinois and California in turn allows them to raise bonds that allows them to build roads. Mm -hmm. It's not as simple as the Federal Reserve creating a giant pile of money and rolling around on top of it like Smaug and waiting for some hobbits to eat. That's not how <laughs> banks work. Smaug. 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 Um, yeah. Um, they, they also don't just print money. M most of the money that the Federal Reserve makes is completely digital. Uh, that's it's on a important. computer. Yeah. There was an awesome movie, and I don't remember the name of it. It was all about a bunch of hackers. It was an 80 movie. 80s movie, so of course it was hackers who were trying to hack into the Federal Reserve Bank so that they could hijack money. That's awesome. I don't even know what this is. <laughs> yeah, and I actually had a friend who worked as an IT guy who caught some Nigerian bank scammers trying to uh, fish for uh, Federal Reserve access codes for the phone system. That kind of reminds me how, like, uh, the movie, you know, a movie will get made about how to do something illegal, and then people actually try to do it in real life. Um, in fact, I think there was a movie based on that, actually. So I wonder if mm -hmm. there's going to be a, a real life thing where someone is doing something based on some based on the idea that you could do that because they sell it in a movie because that would be extremely meta but uh office space you know they tried to do the whole yeah. thing where they take you know the um the fraction of the cent like the superman uh yeah, superman three wow. <laughs> superman. it was three yeah that's right superman four is the one with the nuclear man <laughs> can we just pretend that one didn't exist um by the way can we all agree that man of steel was just garbage can we just say that? It was garbage. It was garbage. It was. It definitely was not the best Superman movie, uh, despite no. some uh, someone in my Discord server would tell you. Uh, so let's go on. Um, uh, inflation. I don't know why I put that there. Let's see. Uh, Lincoln. Okay. Here we go. Lincoln was assassinated because he opposed the Federal Reserve. You mean Reserve. Kennedy? No, no, no. You Lincoln. Mean no, no, no. Lincoln. There is a meme Lincoln that was... goes around. I see it three times a year. And it usually comes from uh, people like... 
uh, the free thought project. So, so the, I mean, the kind of libertarians kind of pass this around and it says these were the only two presidents to stand up to the federal reserve and both of them were assassinated really well, gets, um, really gets um, those almonds churning. Doesn't it? Except so, there wasn't a federal reserve when uh, Abraham yeah, yeah, Lincoln yeah, was, uh, it, it wouldn't uh, exist for another 50 years after he died. So, uh, number one, two, uh, Lincoln was not exactly the most free market kind of guy. Yeah, sure, he was a Republican, but that didn't that means something completely different uh, more than a hundred years. And, ago. and also during during the Civil War, you might have heard of this period of free banking that Jim talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. There was a period of free banking that uh, was up until 19, 1863. and then during eighteen sixty three, when this little Civil War was happening, Mister Abraham Lincoln signed uh, an act to create a new central bank. So why would somebody who create a central bank be assassinated by the central bank a year later? Right. And that's how we got the term greenback because he printed extra money. He inflated the monetary supply, you know, because as, as someone would, who would oppose the fed based on wanting sound money, right. Uh, as they mm. would, uh, to, to inflate the monetary supply to, to, uh, to, uh, to pay for the war. So, uh, no, uh, Lincoln was not a free market guy. Uh, he didn't oppose the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve didn't exist. I, 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 and the closest thing to the Federal Reserve that happened existed because he signed it to law mm-hmm. in, in the last year of his presidency. Yeah, and uh, Old Hickory, I think, closed the second bank. No, he closed the first one. Oh, he closed he the murdered first the first bank. Okay, and so there was a second bank by then? So, yeah. Yes. All right, so um, moving along. JFK was assassinated because he opposed the Fed, and he wrote the executive order 11110, which would would uh, would institute a, uh, the mon- uh, money to be backed by gold and silver, and he was assassinated for doing that. Um, no. No. So let me, let me no. get let me get into the stuff first because I'm the person who every time November rolls around I'm back into uh, digging into JFK assassination conspiracy theories, uh, and I also did a podcast episode 25 which I will link in the description below. We can go and listen to uh, my take on this, and I'll link. Uh, and in there, there's also other links if you don't want to hear me talk about e- it. Even though uh, the uh, Discovery G- Channel, uh, no, the History Channel, excuse me, did an excellent documentary on the Kennedy assassination where they used the most advanced. Uh, film and computer simulations to show that there was a bullet trajectory and it did happen to go back to the Texas school book deposit suppository or mm-hmm. depository. Yeah. And the whole so magic, I'm, magic I'm bullet saying, thing, the magic bullet thing is based on the premise that JFK was sitting directly behind uh, governor Connolly, but he wasn't, he was sitting to his left or uh, his left front. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of different things. And I, I went through the whole thing in that, in that, at piece. the end of the day, we, we now have the signs to incontrovertibly say, Here's where the bullets that shot Kennedy came from. Yeah. It all it came, came from the, the building city. that Oswald was alleged to have been in. Mm-hmm. It was never proven in a court of law, but he was alleged to have been in there. It, sort of. And, it, uh, it was sort of. It was sort of approved by court. Kind go of ahead, sort go, of. go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll clarify later. And, uh, you know, so we, we know where the bullets came from. So it's really the only way for Oswald to have uh, been working for the Federal Reserve. That involves some really complex uh, chalkboard stuff. Yeah. And and uh, and let this also be clear that uh, uh, that Oswald would uh, ideologically be opposed to the things that the Federal Reserve was doing because he's a fucking communist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he was yeah. an avid Marxist. He was fucking psychotic. He was kicked out of the uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, they wouldn't let him in. Um, he was fucking nuts. He beat his wife after he shot JFK. He uh, he ran from the building. He was the only person to flee from the building after the shooting. He shot Officer Tippett, uh, you know, as one would when they're innocent of not murdering anybody. Uh, they had a gun and shot shot a cop for asking him a question. Um, now, when we do a historical reenactment of it, though, he's, he is playing uh, Ice T's F the Police <laughs> while that's uh, happening. Yeah. And uh, it's not hard to shoot someone from uh, 81 meters, especially if you have training, military training and sharp, sharp shooting. Either way, uh, the most important thing is, is that Executive Order 111 one 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 zero uh, was not about institute uh, instituting the money back into uh, to, to gold and silver. Quite the contrary, it was about assisting the Federal Reserve into eliminating the gold standard. It was another step into it, uh, and. The uh, what was the other conspiracy around it was like Lyndon B. Johnson. 
you know, made sure that uh, that you know that that order was was put into place in, in during his presidency, and no so other president fun- ever tried to revoke it. Unfortunately, Ronald Reagan did repeal that law, yes. uh, repeal that executive, that order. executive order. Yeah, but he didn't he didn't do it so some on ideological grounds. He did it because hey, there's a bunch of these executive orders laying around. They're not effective. They're not meaningful. There's no reason to enforce all these ones. Let's just dump the, them in the trash. You mean the reason Kennedy tried to change the executive order and the reason Johnson changed the executive order? Yeah. Because they weren't working? Like that's what the presidents do all the time. Yeah. And by then we had already gotten rid of the, the all you know all, we've already removed all of the, uh, the 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 backing behind the dollar at that time. So th- yeah, there was no reason to, to keep that one around. Well, we removed most of it. Nixon put the final stake yeah, in. Yeah, right, right. Um. So yeah, and also it's also really important because a lot of the conspiracy theories that we're kind of delving into uh, with the around the stuff. Uh, a lot of them have to do with this book called The Creature from Jekyll Island, which I had already talked about in the intro to the last thing, which you heard, right? That was pretty good. You heard because it totally already happened. It totally already happened. Uh, <laughs> this, this this part of it... Um, uh, fucking lost my train of thought here. <laughs> fucking goddamn jokes ruin everything. Um, fuck. So, but, you yeah. know, if you had a recurring gag about something totally already happening, Jim... Your audience would be so slick and in it, they would be appreciating that joke. Right, yeah, right, right. Because they understand your sense of humor. Right, they understand my sense of humor. I forgot where I was going with that. Shit. <laughs> but uh, bottom line, no conspiracy theory for that because yeah. it's a thing presidents do. They undo executive orders and then make slight tweaks yeah. to them. Oh, yeah. it's like, hey, you need to adjust the semicolon here. Yeah. Or this uh, comma here is no longer good English. Oh, I know where so I was we... going with that. All right, so two things. The first thing is that, that that book that it was based on, a lot of these conspiracy theories are coming from, uh, came from the creature from Jekyll Island. And I'm going to post a link in the description of this podcast in the show notes uh, from G. Edward Griffin himself, who did a whole uh, article about why JFK was not assassinated by the Federal Reserve. He is a uh, he is not a, a believer in the Warren Commission report, or he's not. He, he definitely believes there was some sort of conspiracy, but he thinks it has it's completely divorced from anything re- re- regarding around the central bank because he acknowledges. And uh, I also put a thing. I'll, I'll put a link in the description as well to a, a Mises Institute uh, thing as well. If, if that's what you're into, uh, where they talk about the economic policies of uh, JFK and you know how how he really dug in infl- uh, inflationary monetary policy. He was not a gold standard guy at all. He was not anti Fed at all. In fact, he liked the Fed and utilized the Fed in or in his administration. Uh, until the and also, you know, if you're in a rapid period of expansion as we were in the '60s, you know, tight money policy is a is a big downer. Mm-hmm. If you're if you're uh, high on your uh, growth stuff, you want to get a lot of sugar to get even higher. Yeah. I mean, sure, that's not healthy for you, but I mean, fuck it, we'll diet later. Yeah. So we already did the because um, we jumped around a bit. Uh, the Federal Reserve has no responsibility or accountability, and their answer to no one. We've already addressed that one. And if the Federal Reserve does print money, or if we did what the Federal Reserve money does, which is print money and loan money with interest that mm-hmm. would be put in jail for good reason because it's illegal counterfeiting is that's kind of a, a re- stupid thing to say <laughs> let's uh yeah. see here was there anything else that we uh, about the federal reserve that we need to talk about i think we kind of well there is a, there is a oh. question on here are you saying there, that there, there is, is a a big question there is a final question yeah, there's a or final a question, question that may need a final solution embedded in all of this yeah so where do all of these conspiracy theories originate around the federal reserve what is the origin of it like who is the the people who are promoting these things the most and, and what was their ideological bent well it's people who don't like the jews what no way so i, I just I want mean, to clarify here because i need to make this absolutely clear i'm not we're not saying that g edward griffin is an anti-semite I have no reason to believe this. I've dug, dug through his work, even as a believer, and I've never found any anything in there that that would qualify such a thing. Uh, I know people who met him and know him personally, uh, and he never expressed any of those sorts of things. And in fact, a lot of times uh, you can see him on various media hanging out with Jewish people. So it's kind of really kind of hard to claim to what make. What we're saying is, but what we're however, saying, some right. of the rhetorical framing he's using right. is the same people who same rhetorical framing of the people who say that there's seven. Jew bankers who run the world. Right. Um, He's using the same way to imagine how a global finance system works as they do. 
Yeah. So it's it's quite possible that he stumbled on these ideas, maybe from a third uh, another person or whatever who had these ideas and was trying to uh, downplay the 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 anti-Semitic kind of aspect of it and was like, huh, that's really interesting. I'll write a book on that. Uh, but I think that maybe if he was coaxed into it in terms of like, it's the Jews, he probably would not have written the book. Uh, or, or well, we, we, the we watched a little cartoon yeah. in preparation for this episode that uh, <laughs> it, it, it was a little bit more, it was a little bit more explicit that it was the Jews. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a lot of underhanded, like, it was the Jews. Uh, there was also uh, a big and tentacle all, monster that happened, which I don't know if you're was, familiar with. The tentacle monsters were Jews. Yeah, the the. That's a that's a classic so, trope in anti-Semitic propaganda is that the Jews have their <clears throat> tentacles around everything, and they would illustrate and, uh, cartoons and comics with. And the history of Jews things. and banking is kind of. Jews were prevented in the Middle Ages from doing most things because the Catholic Church wanted them to not be Jews. Man. However, there were all sorts of useful jobs and avocations that uh, you you needed people to do, like uh, like banks. That uh, the Catholic Church said, well, you can't charge interest on things. Uh, that's uh, that's unchristian. Mm-hmm. So uh, they went to the Jews, and the Jews did that. Also, pawnbroking, which was a primitive form of banking. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, uh, I'll hold on to your crown jewels, and you agree to pay me a certain amount of money back. And then you get your crown jewels back. Yep. And strangely enough, whenever that happened, uh, the, the Catholic monarch at the time, when he was uh, owed a whole bunch of money, kicked all the Jews out of his country. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, Christians had a religious prohibition on usury, uh, whereas the Jews did not. And so who Well, the Jews it? had a prohibition on usury, but it was a little more complicated. So I'll let you explain it because you know more about that. So we, we go back into to time to the Bronze Age where people were loaning out money and there was debts and there were problems. And those problems generally led to people being enslaved and uh, to banks and debt, debt holders. Imagine that. And every so often, a new king would come in and say, you know what, all debts are voided. Well, that caused a problem, of course, because, you know, the interest rates would get a lot higher as it comes closer to the likely forming of a jubilee year, which is something that's actually dictated in the Bible. It says in the Bible that you're supposed to do that. It also says some other fun things. It says if a member of your family is in debt, it's your obligation as his family members to help buy him out of debt. That's also a biblical obligation. And uh, if a family member's in debt, you know, you're obligated to help him maintain his share of the family money and land and all that. Mm-hmm. Well, Jewish thinkers, as time went on, realized that's still preventing people from getting money. And sometimes you need a loan. Sometimes you need a lot of credit to get things. So they came up with various schema that were Torah appropriate to charge people loans and then go into collections and loan sharking and things of that nature. When you said scheming, were you rubbing your hands like you found I said it? schema, oh, not scheming. I was going to say, because I was wondering if you were rubbing your hands like you just found out the uh, that the uh, the lunch combo at uh, Little Caesars is only $4 now. Oh, that's right. It is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but because- serious question. How, how if, if if Little Caesars has twenty thousand ovens, how could the, it would take them like eighty years to bake <laughs> to, to bake six million pizzas? Really gets that boggles that noggin, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and of course you know pizza is a uh, ethnic store for Jews, which is another layer onto that meme. Because you know Jews Seriously, going to the oven. What was Little Caesars thinking when they made that ad? What were they I don't know. I don't know. I, I think I know what happened. I think uh, the CEO said, "Hey, uh, I'm looking at all these ad pitches. I really like this one." And one of the board members is like, ah, "I don't think that's a good look. Maybe we should not." No, like, no, man. My kid says this is totally okay. And he's, and he's on like, the internet memes. And he's like, "No, I, I don't think that's okay." And he's like, "Screw optics. I'm going in." <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's so Jews, because gonna, of religious... I'm, by the way, I'm going to post a link to the Little Caesars article in case you're <laughs> out of the loop on this one. Yeah. I don't know what they were thinking. This was not that. us making a really weird segue. So yeah. <laughs> in addition to Jewish religious law, you know, requiring people to get help out of debt and all that, Jews were restricted to doing things that weren't per- allowed under the Bible. Jews also, for religious reasons, wanted to, and to some extent still want to remain a separate community. So for them handling money and being able to be separate and independent and self-reliant because they were handling finance money. That was a win-win sort of scenario. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that sort of created the whole mindset of who's being evil bankers that run the world 
and are responsible for all the world's wars. Yep. And then that's where, you that's also where that got, came from. And you also got things like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is a mm-hmm. hoax document. Financed by the Catholic it was financed by the Catholic Church. Uh, the, the history of the of, of that of that document is so spurious. There's like thirty different explanations about where it came from and all of them have just as much credence as the next. I'm really kind yeah. of skeptical on anyone who tries to, to make some origin claim. Uh, uh, the only the only time I've ever heard anyone make an origin claim that I thought was good was he told one of them, and then he said, like, uh, is this true? I don't know. I, the only reason why I'm positing this particular one is because I find it the most entertaining, because none of them really have any real... Well, I mean, there were a whole lot of people who confessed as they were dying that I wrote horrible things for the Catholic Church, and it was wrong. Okay. Because, you know, when you're on your deathbed and you're a guy who forges and uh, publishes various do- propaganda documents, you kind of want to unburden your soul. Especially if you believe in a God that wants you to uh, confess your soul. So the uh, Rothschild Bank was just a successful group of banks that made a whole lot of money. The Rothschild family bought into the English aristocracy and nobility. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that, that's the extent of the Rothschild Bank's strategic advantage yeah and they and they, they kind of knew had kind of inside connections that knew what was happening and they know how to buy and yeah. sell things at the right times oh <clears throat> someone's going to war well we better buy bonds in this country by the way you know that's what real banks do yeah oh, oh, that's just, you know bill and the Hillary banks. Clinton and other elite another elite what business now? relationships with Sorry, Goldman. what was that was something about elite what it, bill <laughs> try that one more time with Try that one more time. It's <laughs> with companies like Okay, Bill. try that one more time. It, <laughs> We're going to keep doing it until you, until the internet lets us Bill it right. and Hillary Clinton okay. and other political and economic elites have special relationships with institutions like Goldman Sachs. Mm. And as part of that relationship, they get access to privileged information and they make political decisions and financial decisions based upon that. Yeah. Also, a fun little fact, members of Congress and uh, key staffers are exempt from the insider trading laws. Mm-hmm. And uh, Goldman Sachs and other big banks know where the members of Congress and the Senate are investing their money and are acting accordingly. So while the bank may not have all the information and it's illegal for them to do so, they know the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee is investing a lot of money in very interesting places, so we should invest some of our money there too. Yeah. Not, not, nothing, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. <laughs> no, 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 nothing out of the ordinary. No. it's all fine. You're, they're, they're may, you may have some ethical objections to it, but it's definitely not. Well, the you know the Jews are are organizing the banks and everything. It's like no, this is something that the people wanted at the time because of a misdiagnosis of what was going on <clears throat> in the economy, and they just said, mm-hmm. hey, it wouldn't it be great if we had if the federal government had a reserve of money. To bail out the banks during a, 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 a crisis and to be someone, and also, a, I don't know what's, what the term is. I'm just going to make something up to be the lender of last resort. Exactly. Right. And also, let's say there was a rampant inflation pro- problem in the country. Wouldn't it be great if there was an institution that could slow that inflation down mm-hmm. so that inflation doesn't, you know, destroy wealth? Yeah. Like one and the- likewise, if there was deflation destroying wealth. Wouldn't it be nice if there was an institution that could counter deflation? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, kind of cutting according to this, uh, what's the right term? <laughs> according to this kind of, uh, kind of philosophy and, uh, in, in, uh, monetary policy, the, the, you know, the idea that, you know, deflation, you know, cause I, I agree that deflation is a good idea, but there, there are kind of objections to, to it, which I, I think if they're valid. Deflation and inflation in excess are harmful. Right. Um, but, but their, their kind of argument against that would be, oh, we well, have things like sticky wages where like you go and work for a business and you know, you, you're, you're working for a business and you're getting paid, let's say $10 an hour. And that $10 an hour is worth, uh, you know, three gold coins, right? Let's just say that just, right. just for ease of math. Right. Well, then it turns out because of deflation, um, you know, though that $10 an hour is now worth four coins of gold, right? So you're making more money, even though you didn't get a raise or anything. So uh, but, now, now your labor but, is actually a cost onto the business because all the but, prices are going down, and y- your boss has to come to you and say, "Hey, we're giving you a pay cut. 
nobody's going to like that. So their idea is, well, if we just inflate the monetary policy, then they would incentivize the, it's easier for a, 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 a business owner to offer raises rather than offer pay to clients. Also which, which, I don't, I don't, in, in a deflationary economic scenario, let's start with eggs. Eggs is a basic resource. If eggs, the price of eggs deflates below the cost it takes for them to be produced, you know, what's going to happen. Farmers are going to fucking destroy eggs. Mm -hmm. Until the price retroactively fits itself. So supply is going to decrease until cost manages. And as that supply decreases, that causes wild spikes in prices. Which means that as your wages are going down, prices are going up. That is what an extreme deflationary spiral yeah. can cause. I, I would like to debate you on that, <laughs> but I'm not going to. It's, Mommy, by the way, I, I want to point something out. I want to point something out. This is this is a lesson for anybody who creates media, right? We are having a discussion about the Federal Reserve. So if you're having like I don't know a Q and A with an economist, uh, and you're just supposed to be asking them questions, it's a good idea to not to try to turn it into debate because that would be kind of weird, and the turning yeah, <laughs> and people would see that as a uh, as a someone who has a if big you, ego uh, being attacked. So especially if you're asking questions of an, an economist, and then you call the questions a debate. And then say people should have known what you meant. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry for turning this into a, a sorry for turning your questions and answer segment into a questions and answer segment. I'm sorry about but, that. But I mean, that, that is a fairly esoteric argument about the English language, though, don't you think, Jim? It's, it's very esoteric. It's very esoteric. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. So. Where can they find more about your information uh, so we can, we, can, we can know where you live and, and burn your house down for advocating the Federal Reserve? <laughs> well, I mean... <laughs> no, um, be better way of phrasing that. Where can we learn more about Larry Bernard? Because we like you and, and we want to subscribe to your newsletter. Well, Mr. Jim and I participate in a little uh, YouTube show that's going to become a full-time podcast called Recording in Progress. Yep. Right now it's a streaming YouTube streaming show. Or we, it's a stream, streaming YouTube where we're in the process of making it a full-time uh, podcasty doobly do. Mm -hmm. Once we get my, I back. also am on a on a little show called The Wilk Report, which is a streaming YouTube show, mm -hmm. and I guest host frequently on Midnight's Edge After Dark, which is a, another YouTube streaming podcast doobly do. Yeah. Well, none of these are podcasts. The only podcast right now is the Lullbirds because it's is, is this like, one. Yes. Because by, I mean, by definition, look, look, podcasts normies, are feeds. normies don't know the difference. Okay. Yeah, but normies, normies are considered all stupid. Normies eat blood sausage. <laughs> hey, blood sausage can be delicious. Mm. I, I'm sorry. I'm only making that joke because of Groundhog's Day. <laughs> Which uh, is a fantastic, fantastic film. Which and, uh, I didn't course, watch this. Damn it, I'm watching it tonight. I forgot to watch it this guy. I watch it every Groundhog's Day, and I didn't watch this Groundhog's Day. It's one of my favorite movies and, uh, of all time. It's right up there with you, you, Taxi Driver. It's right up there with uh, it, uh, with Freddy Got Fingered. It's one of the best movies ever made. Yeah. So yeah, uh, so recording in progress. It's a. Sh it's not a libertarian show. It, there's libertarian. It's themes about to pop it, culture and entertainment. Right, pop culture and entertainment. Where basically you kind of go over the stories of the day. I kind of react to them, and then we both do movie and TV show reviews and stuff. Which, by the way, uh, this, it'll had already come out by the time this one comes out. But uh, we're going to be reviewing. I'm going to be reviewing the new Tick show, which I've already started watching. It's fucking fantastic. And uh, shit, I'm I'm, I'm also going to be talking about the new Hellboy movie that everybody's. Expecting to be awful. Yeah. So yeah. So this is at least until we have like another special that I think is going to be relevant. I think I'm probably just going to put only the 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 ones that rhyme in twenty five of the Lulberts on my on my main YouTube channel. The the twenty fives for conspiracies. Yeah, but what's the conspiracy for one twenty five? Uh, well, one twenty five. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it might be a good idea to have people leave a comment in the in in the uh, in the box below to let me know what kind of crazy libertarian thing they want me to go after next. That would be great. Yeah. And uh, and also again, one more apology for uh, for repeating the April Fool's Day joke of last year, but you guys bought it again, so. Make fun of me all you want. <laughs> also, also, Jim and I have uh, I, I've, I've pitched some ideas for Jim for next year's April Fool's Day joke. Oh yeah. Well, we're not going to do April Fool's jokes 
ever again. Never, ever, ever. So you should listen in if a show comes out on April 1st. I'm just saying. Exactly. You should just listen because it might be good. But I, w- I will say that I'm, I'm not doing the music thing anymore because I did it twice. <laughs> I did it twice in a row. And uh, I know one person complained about it. One person was like, you did that last year. But it's like, you fell for it again, though. You still fell for it. <laughs> so make fun of me all you want. All right, Larry, thanks for coming on. Help, thanks for helping me uh, go after this thing. Um, that's, that's great, Jim. And uh, also, thank you for that compelling earlier content that totally has already been recorded. Right. right. I, I put a lot of effort and research into that uh, that I'm going to have to do more of later for... Um, An unrelated reason. Unre- completely unrelated reason. A completely unrelated reason. So anyway, so thanks for coming on. You can follow Larry at, at Karasoth. I'll let you spell that. On the Twitter, dot doobly-doo. Yeah, it'll, I, I won't let you spell it. You can look it up in the, in the show. K-A-R-A-S-O-T-H. Yeah, you can find them there. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and, because, and because I guess there is a religious aspect of this, <laughs> this show, because we were talking about the Jews, uh, Hail Satan. Well, hi, I'm. <laughs> <laughs>